Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Mind Map Task Manager. In this week's episode, I'm going to show you how to create this incredible mind mapping application complete with projects, tasks, and fully updatable tasks. All we need to do is just make a few changes and then click save and then that task will be automatically updated within the mind map on just a click. We're going to show you that, filters, and a whole lot more. I hope you'll stick with us. So let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining me today. I am really excited to bring you the Mind Mapping Tax Manager. I have had many requests for a mind map, and so today, combined with the Task Manager, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to bring this to you in Excel like we do each and every week. Of course, all I ask is just a few things. If you have not subscribed yet, please do that. Go ahead and click the links down below. And either with your Facebook Messenger or with your email, we're going to get that sent over to you absolutely free. All you need to do is just a few things. Don't forget to click that subscribe button and hit that notification icon bell. That is going to ensure that you get these trainings each and every week sent to you, notified to you, which is going to help us out a lot. Also, if you are new to VBA, we do a lot of VBA work, and I've got a few courses on VBA to help, but nothing like the Ultimate Excel VBA course by my friend Daniel Strong. Daniel brings you everything from the beginning all the way up to expert level in VBA. So if these trainings are a little bit advanced for you, Daniel's course is an amazing course. I hope you pick that up. I've got a special discount. He's been offering Excel for freelancers followers. So I'll make sure to add that link below. Go ahead and click the link. And if you're new to VBA, that's going to get you set up to where you can do these applications and a whole lot more very effortlessly when you join his course. So go ahead and click that link. All right, great. So I've got a really great mind map task manager for you today. And basically we have here, we've got projects where we can create additional projects. We have staff, each staff can be assigned a project. And then each project you can have multiple tasks assigned to it, right? The colors denote the status of the task, right? So notice we've got different colors. Those colors are fully customizable here inside our admin screen where we have tasks. We have to do, we've assigned that to a yellow color in progress, green, overdue in red, and completed in blue. So that way you'll see certain different tasks have different colors, right? And so you can see, we know that when we click on this site scope, we're gonna see that that is the to do. If we click here on the client meeting, we're gonna show that that is in progress. If we were to change that to overdue and save that, that is automatically going to be updated right here to that red color. So that's gonna denote there inside the admin. And of course, completed, we have in blue. We also have icons, right? Our staff, we have an icon for staff, we have an icon for project, one for tasks, and one for view the tasks. Now, as you, as an end user, you can update those and or use a developer, I'm going to show you how to automatically add those icons. Now, if we were to add a staff, we'd see the icon. If we had no picture for the staff, we'd see the, see the staff picture, right? So we also have a folder here. This folder is going to denote where our staff pictures are located. I've got a folder right here, and this is where our staff pictures are located, right? If I were to make a change, a small change to that staff folder here, let's say we have an incorrect path and I run this and I refresh it, we're going to see that we don't have a correct connection to those staff pictures, right? So it's not going to work. But what we're going to do is we can use an icon instead, which is kind of nice. So that is where you see this staff icon come in here. And I'm going to show you how we do that. If I make the career, if I use the correct path there, making a small change, refreshing that you're going to see that it's automatically refreshed and we now see the picture show up right fred is assigned to a certain amount of projects right we may want to see all staff all projects all statuses or maybe we only want to show fred in to do right so if i were to click click here and then show james new house or show particular so it's only showing here it's very specific projects that are only to do right so if we want to know only those are completed or maybe those are only to do we would then show that we can only show so when we refresh that james newhouse we see that these two tasks are overdue based on a mind map right and of course if we are going to show all statuses when we do ahead and refresh that it's going to then show all statuses so i'm going to show you how to do that and also we have dates right so notice 
we have a start from date and we have a due date from date. So we can sh show it only uh, tasks that are built based on those dates. So each task has different, we have a project where we can select. We can also add a new project dynamically. So if we were to enter a brand new project here, that's gonna automatically enter. I'll show you how to do that. We've got staff here. If I decide I wanna create a brand new staff, so let's say I wanna create Sally Smith and Sally Smith is no longer, is not a staff. And I save that, it's gonna say, hey, Sal, this staff has not previously been added. Would you like to add it now? Yes. Of course, we don't have a picture for that, but that's okay. If I were to then refresh it, we're going to then show that Sally Smith here now is located. Of course, there's no picture attached, so we can dynamically add that. And we added this client meeting to this brand new staff here. So it's extremely dynamic and very, very powerful. If we are to remove or reduce the projects and the task, it's going to show up. So there's a really there's a lot of ways that we can dynamically make changes to this. And I'm going to show you every step of the way, every line of code, every format and how we created this. So also inside our database, we've got a list of tasks. So all the tasks are located here. Each task has an ID, a task name and a staff ID and a staff assigned to that task, a status, as you saw, start date and due date a project ID and a project name, and then a description as you saw. And then we have a list of projects here. We also have a list of staff here. So we noticed that Sally Smith got added. If we were to, of course, add a, a picture for Sally Smith, that would then show up, right? So let's say we do have a picture in that folder for Sally Smith. Let's say this, let's use this Mary, because I don't have, or Lisa. Let's say lisa.jpg, right? If I add lisa.jpg and i know that the path is correct and we don't necessarily need an email and if we go back to the mind map and i refresh that automatically that picture is going to show up we now have a picture for sally smith here because that's mapped properly so all we need to do is just ensure that one the picture name is correct and we also need to make sure that our file path that we've browsed for is the correct folder and of course if you want all these icons and all the pictures that i use that is going to be available inside our patreon platform patreon's a great platform where I do lots and lots more way beyond the initial training in YouTube. So if you'd like to get on that and you want to add additionally, you want features added, you want me to fix something or focus on something, I'm doing all that inside the Patreon platform along with PDF downloads, early advanced videos, downloadable training videos, PDF downloads, discounts, and a whole lot more. So I hope you'll join us there on Patreon. It's a really great platform. So we understand the uh, staff can be added dynamically and I guess eventually maybe on our Patreon we can add a picture here a little button for a picture so we could actually map that picture to the staff we could do that that's something we can add on so as far as the task it's relatively simple just some basic information when I expand on the staff I want to know all the projects located notice that the staff changed to Fred Fredders here right and I want to know all of those projects that Fred is on and then as long as it's from the start date here from the out and then all statuses i want to know the fred's remodel and then when i expand those i want to make sure that those move up so let's go ahead and reduce those now let's say i expand just one project and we're going to show four different types of tasks on that now if i expand another one we're not going to have enough space so i need to make sure that the spacing automatically changes based on those tasks and again if i expand this fred's house remodel and there's three tasks associated with that i need to make sure that there's space so i'm going to show you how to do that and of course i'm going to show you how to use these connectors to connect both the projects to the tasks and to connect both the staff to the project. So we're gonna be showing you that as well. Okay, so you've got pretty much a round uh, view of everything that we're gonna be doing inside this and how that works. And we're gonna go into it step by step and I'm gonna take you through every step. So I hope you'll stick with us. This one, I will show you everything and how we did it. And to keep in mind that we're gonna need something when we click refresh, what that's gonna do is gonna clear all those out. And it's gonna also let us know exactly how many staff it's gonna clear based on this. And all that is based on this data here inside the task. So we're task, we're looking for all the data. But the first thing what I want to know is when I filter this data, I want to know all of the ta staff that are scheduled on tasks between these two dates, right? With a start date. And I wanna make sure that the due date is gonna be less than this, right? And I wanna make sure that it's gonna be from the due date, due date from 7.30 and a start date from 5.01. So I wanna make sure it fits within those dates. And to do that, we're gonna run an advanced filter. The first filter that I wanna run is I wanna know all the staff that are associated on tasks from those dates. So to do that, we need to set up a filter. And there's gonna be a filter based on these 
all of these and we can do that directly inside the task so if we scoot on over here we see that we have here some criteria here we have mind map criteria now these are all based on individual criteria that we're setting up so if we take a look inside the mind map and i decide i'm going to expand fred we see that fred is now the staff that's been selected if we go back into the tasks, we see that now Fred is now the assigned staff. So that means that the results, those unique staff, right, or those unique projects are only going to come inside here. It's the unique projects this is what we want to focus on. Those unique projects are only for Fred. Notice these three projects. These are all unique results that came directly from here, our data. And that's Fred's house, Johnson. So these are these three projects have been assigned to Fred only. And so those results are going to come here. Okay. So we're going to take it based on that criteria. So now what we need to do is we need to develop criteria that is directly based on these cells here. K H3 for the staff, J3 for the projects, L3 for all the statuses, and then O3 and R3 for the start date from and due date from. And that's just what we've done in here. So what we're going to be doing is we need a formula to base on that. And we need two rows of criteria because we're dealing with dates here. So what we're going to be doing is the first thing what I want to do is create a formula. If the mind map sheet H3 equals all staff, then show empty, right? I don't want to show any specific staff for that or every task associated. However, if it is not empty, I want to show that specific staff that's been located and we're gonna do that for two consecutive rows for both 03 and 04 it is gonna be the same formula also if there's a project name has been selected if I do select a project let's say Fred's house remodel I want to make sure that the project selected is put directly in J3 therefore only those particular tasks that are dealing with Fred's house remodel will show up in the mind map will show up right here and so that's what I want to show. So again, inside that our criteria, we now see that the project name is also it's a very similar formula, except we're dealing with J3. If J3 equals all projects, then we're going to show anything that's not blank. Otherwise, we are going to show whatever's in J3. And it is that same formula in both P3 and P4. We need two rows because we're dealing with dates. We're dealing with two different dates. So we want to make sure that we're going to show both of those. Okay. And again, just like that, if I filter down a criteria, as you can imagine, maybe I only want to show those that are, uh, let's say, in progress. And if I bring this and, and refresh it, we're only going to show those that are in progress. So inside the task, as you guessed it, the task is going to show just that in progress. And we can do that again with this formula L3. If it's equals all statuses, we're just going to show any task that's not empty. And then otherwise, we're going to show exactly whatever status that is. In this case, it is in progress. I also want to set up these start dates. And this is where the gets a little bit tricky because we're going to show dates. And I want to show it less in this case, right? If the mind map 03, I want to do is empty, then I'm just going to show everything greater than zero, right? Anything that contains a start date is what we're going to show. No specific date. Otherwise, we are going to show greater than or equal 03, right? I want the start date greater than or equal to that specific date. And notice the number, right? I want I don't want to show that in a date format. That 44682 is actually equal to this date, um, May 1st, right? I want to make sure that this date is in numerical form. And that way, regardless of the format that we're using here, it will provide the correct filter. And then I also want to make sure that it is less than, I want to make sure that it is less, that start date is actually less than the due date here because I want to show this less than R3, right? So less than or equal to R3. And that's going to do just right that. So any dates that are less than, if I want to show due dates from that, right? Or up until that time, I want to show less than, if R3 is blank, I'm going to show less than all dates, which is going to use a large number. Otherwise, if it is not blank, we're going to show less than or equal to the due date of R3. And also, likewise, in the due date, I want to show very, very similar. So this is for the start date. Right? I want to show the due date of if the due date is left blank, then I want to show less than or equal to a large number, right? Just to make sure that every single due date is considered. Otherwise, I want to make sure that the due date is greater than or equal to R3. I want to make sure that it's greater than, all right? And that's going to provide us with the proper date filters so we can do any start date from 51 up until due dates from 730. And that's going to show us only those tasks. If I were to refresh that, it's going to clear out all projects, all statuses, and all staff. I'm just going to show us a list of those staff. 
Okay. If I were to click on here again or click on here, it's going to show us individual mind maps for the individual staff, a single staff at a time. Otherwise, it's going to get too messy, right? So we're going to show this, and we can show this. I don't believe I have too many tasks assigned for these, but we can show individual tasks for these projects, and they're going to be automatically spaced out. And that's what we're going to go into first. Okay, so the first thing what I want to do is we're going to show you on this refresh how do we create this list of staff based on the criteria here. Well, the first thing what we need to do is we need to have some samples. Notice I've got some shapes here. I've got a sample shape called MM sample or mind map sample. And that is for our sample shape. We're going to take that sample. We're going to create duplicates from it and we can size them accordingly. So the size of this doesn't necessarily matter. VBA will take care of the size. And I've got a picture location here. This will show either the icon or the picture of the staff. And it's going to call it staff sample. So we're going to use these as sample. We'll be duplicating them with VBA and then VBA will place them accordingly and also place the text. And I've got some lines and connectors which we'll go through. And I've got some icons here. Now these icons are going to be pulled directly from the admin screen. So what the macro is going to do, it's going to look, it's going to look, loop through all these icons, it's going to look for an icon. And if an icon is found, it's going to put them here. But first it will delete any icons here. So for example, if I were to delete these icons and I want to run that map macro one more time, all I need to do is click refresh and those were going to reappear right here because they are copied, deleted, and copied through the macro. And that way, if we decide to change one of these icons, all we need to do is then click refresh, and that change will be reflected automatically, and it will be showing up here and both in the tasks along with the preview. So it's very easy to change those icons dynamically, and I'm going to show you how to do that. All right, so let's get start getting into the macro and see how we do that. We're also going to go over how we save, how we add new tasks, how we had delete, and how we load tasks simply by just clicking on a task icon to load the task details. So we're going to get into all of that. So let's go ahead and get into the developers, right? If you don't have that available, of course, you can just click Alt F11 to get you directly into the Visual Basic. We have three different modules. First, application macros having to do with the admin screen, the mind map macros, that's going to be building our mind map. And then we have the task manager, which you can be able to the macros, which will, of course, we're going to be able to save, delete, update, our tasks. Okay, so let's get into the application macros. These are going to be the sum that we worked with on the admin. We be able to actually add an icon here if we want to. We will be, if we de I decided I want to change, let's say I wanted to change tasks to this little icon here, I could do that right here and just click OK. And then as soon as I refresh it right here, we're going to show you that brand new icon is going to be available here. So we'll then see our new projects has this icon. So we can easily change our tasks to our icon or projects icon or anything we want in here. All we need to do is just change it right in here. So adding a new one. So that's gonna be a really cool, I'll go ahead and change it back to our tasks, the one we had here. So we can see we can change icons on demand very, very easily. And we can do that with a macro. Well, the first thing that happens is I've got a selection change event, right? When I make a selection here, something happens, right? First thing that happens is I want to color this row. We can use conditional formatting to do that. So when I highlight that and I go into the conditional formatting, we're going to see their specific rule that's going to be based on T1 row. So that selected row, that row is going to be placed directly in T1. When that specific row, 8 through 12, either row, is goes into cell T1. I want that color, that dark blue fade with a white font and I want that to be bold. So it's the font's going to be white and of course it's going to be a bold type. And we're going to put that so that our macro is going to take care of it. Our macro, when I make a selection change, it's going to go directly inside this cell T1 over here. You see that in the upper right. Okay, That is the icon row that's selected. It's also the icon number. So actually, excuse me, T1, which is here. So 9. So as soon as I select something else, it's going to be gone. However, if I make that selection again, you see T1 now takes on 10 in the upper right corner. So that is going to handle our condition forming, and that handles on selection change. So the selection change event is going to come directly from the admin screen. So when I click on admin, we have the first thing is selection change. And down, if we scroll down in here, we're looking for specific cells. When we make selection change to those specific cells, it's going to be anywhere from E8 all the way to F12, E8 through F12. So when I make that change right here, on when I make an intersection, basically, if not intersect, meaning I make a selection 
anywhere on that cell in that range that I want something to happen. The first thing what I want to make sure is I want to place whatever the row that we've selected directly into T1. This will trigger the conditional format. It triggers the conditional formatting. So we have that next up, I want to focus on some shapes. As we saw, there's two shapes here, two little buttons here. One is our add icon button, and the other is our clear icon button. If I want to clear the icon, I can, all I do is just click delete, and that's going to clear that icon. Notice the icon's now been removed. If I want to add it again, I just click plus, and then I'm going to add that icon again. Okay, so how do we add icons dynamically? Well, the first thing what I want to do is make sure that these buttons are placed directly in the right place. And I've got two buttons here, of course, both of those, and we can do that with the following lines of code, right? So once we make a selection and we add that row, then what I want to do is I want to focus on that add icon button. So that button is just two shapes and grouped together, and I've grouped them and given them a specific name. That's the name add icon button that I've given it to. With that button, I want to place it directly in column G based on that target target row. That's going to be that left position. I want that top position also in G in the target row and placed in that top position. That's going to place it. And I also want to make sure it is visible. And now regardless of whatever the user clicks, I want the first thing of what I want to do is if that ad icon is visible, I want to make it hidden. That way it's hidden no matter what they select. Then only if they make a selection within this range do I want it to appear. Otherwise, it stays hidden. And it's going to be the same thing for that clear icon button. That also, if we select anything, we want that to hidden. If we select only those shapes, we want that clear icon button to show up. But I want to show up a little bit to the right this time, not exactly on the left, because I don't want them to overlap. So what we're going to do with that clear icon button, we're going to show it up. The left is going to be based on the left position of G. Plus, we're going to add 16 pixels to the right so that it shows up a little bit to the right. And it's going to have the same top position. Then I also want to make sure that that is visible. There have been two macros that have been assigned to that. Else, it means if they click anything outside of this range, I want to make sure to clear T1. And that's going to get rid of that conditional formatting. Great. Also, we want to show a color palette on selection changes. If I want to make a ch color change to one of these to-dos or status, if I want to change the color to-do, maybe I want to change it to, I can use any color inside that, or I can use, of course, any color that I want as well. So if I want to use like a yellow to-do, I could do that. And that, if I decide to do that, and we go ahead and click my map, and we refresh it again, and then I don't think we need it to do. Here we go. So we get now we get a color for the phone meeting is the yellow. So we can easily add it. And of course, we refresh that. It's going to change those icons. Now we've all already updated those icons. So we see that it's now in yellow, and we have that updated icon. So we can quickly and easily change the colors very, very simply through either this pop-up or with colors. So it's going to match whatever color is in here. So this color palette, this is called the color palette palette, right? And I want that displayed, but I only want that displayed if they've selected a particular cell anywhere from C8 all the way through C12. So we're going to take a look at that. That's going to be based on the selection change of C8 through C12. With that color palette, I want that to show up on the C in the target row to left, right? I also want to place it on the row below they've selected, right? If they select this row, I want to place it directly on the row below along C column. To do that, we're going to base it on that target row, but plus one, meaning one row down. That's where I want to place the top position of that color palette. I want to make sure it's visible, and I want to bring the order to the front. Why is that important? Because I don't want it to show up under these icons, right? I don't want these icons to show up above it. So I want this color palette to show up on top of these icons, right? So that's where the Z order is going to come in handy. Okay? So we want that means it's going to place it on top. That Z order is going to bring it to the front, meaning bring it above all other shapes. Again, or also if that if we select first thing we do, if that color palette is visible, we are going to make sure to hide it when we select anything else. I only want that color palette showing up if we make a selection on that range. Okay, so that's going to hide. That's what we do here. If it's visible, that color palette, we're going to hide it. Great. So that's it for the on screen. As far as on the admin screen, that's all the macros, and they're based on the selection change. If we go back into the application macros, we see that we had a macro called add icon. That particular macro is tied to this particular button right here. If we assign the macro to the group, you won't see any macro. However, if we click inside, zooming in, and if I click inside any particular shape here, holding down the control, we will see that we have a specific macro that's been assigned to any button here. So let's take a look inside the button here, any kind of macro inside this, we can see that for example, this one here, we right click and we assign the macro, we see that we have that called 
add icon. When we click edit, we're going to see that that is that same add icon. And so that's the macro that I've tied to this button here. Basically, it's a shape and an icon grouped together and given a name called add icon button. When I select any particular shape inside that, right inside that group, if I click assign macro, we see it's the add icon add button. Okay, so we get into that macro. What do we want to happen? We're going to focus on the admin screen. I want to have some, the selected row is going to be T1, right? I've got to know what row we're associated, what icon, right? First thing I want to know is what row. In this case, it's row H, right? So knowing that row is going to help us place. I want to place both the thing. Let's go ahead and add that staff icon back in right here. So I need to know where to place that icon. And I also want to place that name of that icon directly in F and whatever the selected row is. So having that selected row inside a variable is very important. First thing I want to do is also determine if there's any existing icon there, I want to remove it. Now, each one of these icons has a very specific name. This first one, this staff, this is our first icon. We're going to call this icon one. Second one's going to be called icon two here. Let's go ahead and add that in. Everything's so small. Icon two and then icon three. I also want to show that task. So I'm going to go in order one, two, three, all the way up to five. So I know that if I'm going to be removing an icon in row eight, how do I know it's icon one? Well, all I need to do is simply deduct seven, right? So if I know that we're in eight, if I deduct seven, that's going to leave us with one. So I know the icon number that's associated with this called icon one. So to do that, all we need to do is first remove any existing icons that might be associated. It's going to be called a name, given a name called icon and the selected row, the first one will be eight minus seven. That's going to be icon one. I'm going to delete that. If it doesn't exist, it will create an error. So therefore, we've wrapped it in on air resume next and on error to go to zero. Then what I want to do is I want to set the icon. I want to have the user browse for that. We've already defined the icon file as a file dialog. So we can then set it to the icon file is equal to the application file dialog. MSO file dialog file picker, right? That's going to allow us to pick a specific picture file. Then we can associate it with that. So with the icon file, I'm going to set a title called please select an icon. I want to give it a filter. I don't want the user to be able to select any type of file. I only want them to select on picture files. So we're going to filter by those picture files. It's going to be any type of a name using the asterisk JPG any type of a PNG with any type of a name. So we're going to use that wildcard before the period and then the extension of JIF, JPG or GIF, right? Only want one associated item and then allow multi-select false. Of course, just a single item that allows you to select. If they don't select anything, we need to allow them to get out of it. So if show one does not equal negative one, if it does equal negative one, that means they have selected something. I don't know why. Seems kind of confusing, but that's the actual truth. So if show it does not equal negative one, meaning they click the cancel or have not selected anything, we're going to go to no selection. It's going to skip all that and go right down. If they have made a selection, what I want to do is I want to put that file name. What is the name of that file? I want to put it directly inside F8 or F and whatever the selected row is. So we're going to do that here. Admin F and the selected row value is simply the directory, meaning the file name of that selected item. This is the full path of that file that they've selected. When we extract only the name from it, we're going to wrap it a directory around it, and that's going to give us just the file name. Then what I want to do is I want to then insert that icon, right? Insert, I want to take that icon, and I want to put it directly inside column right here, column E, and I want to place it at the beginning of column E. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert that icon using the file path of the selected item one, using that specific file path. I also want to give it a very specific name once I've inserted it called icon in the selected row minus seven, meaning icon one, two, three, four, five. It's going to create that icon. Now we've placed that icon on the sheet, but we haven't sized it and we have not positioned it. So that's what we want to do next. We can focus directly on that brand new icon by calling it out by name, the name that we've given assigned to it. We're going to place that left position in the admin and the column E and the selected row plus one, meaning we're just going to, we don't want it exactly on the right. We want to move it slightly over uh, right, not on the left, but a little bit over to the right. I also want to place the top position also on the same column and the same row and the top position plus one. I want to give it a very specific width and a very specific height, making it square using width 12 and height 12. And then I want to make sure it's visible. That's it. That's all we need to do is add an icon. Now notice that we have clear an icon. To clear an icon, it's very simple. All we need to know is what row that's associated, right? If I know that the selected icon row is eight, you see when we selected something else, of course, when it's eight, right, then I know that the icon number is going to be 
icon one. That's the one we want to remove. And so we can determine that by based on the selected row. So we're going to get that selected row inside T1. This icon clear, this is the macro that's been assigned to that clear button. And then what I'm going to do is simply delete it. If it doesn't exist, it would create an error. So therefore, we've wrapped it in on error, resume next, and on error, go to zero. That is it. Theoretically, we could clear the name as well. All right. Also, we want to be able to set the status color. There's another macro. Remember the macro that's associated here. If I were to click on a color here and I want to set a color here, I could do that. Now, what I want to do is set that color there. There's a macro that's been involved. So when I click on here, we click on any individual shape inside this group of shapes and we sorry it's off the here we want to assign the macro to that we can see that it's been called macro admin set status color so that's the macro that we're going into right admin set status color all we need to do is look to the active cell whatever she were on we're going to change that interior color that interior color is going to be based on that selected shape how do we know the name of the selected shape? We can use application color, something we're also going to be using a little bit later. I want to know what the fill color is of that shape, right? It's right here, fill for color RGB. We're going to take that color and we're going to make the interior color of that shape. Then also I want to do is hide that color palette. That's all we have to do. Last thing is simply browse for staff picture folder. This is the macro that's simply been tied to this here. So that way when we browse for the file, we can simply browse for it and locate that staff picture folder here. And then we could just browse. So that's going to browse for that. That's the macro that allows us to browse for that folder. It's going to place that file path directly inside D3. So to do that, we can do that with this browse for staff file picture. This is the macro that's been assigned to that button. We're going to mention the bill folder not really the bill folder right should this be the staff folder let's make that change just so we're a little more accurate as you can see sometimes i just copy and paste this code as we all do and then i'm going to find bill right and i'm going to place with the word staff because i like that a little bit better and just place staff okay and then replace all that looks a little bit better it's three replacements so browse for staff picture folder the staff folder equal the file dialog the staff folder is equal to the application this time we're using a folder picker folder picker okay it's different and then what i want to do is i'm going to set the staff folder browse for <laughs> got lazy here staff folder and not lazy busy busy allow for the multi select just one folder we want them to select again if they may, don't make a selection we're going to go to no selection whatever that selected that full folder path we're going to place directly in d3 that's it that's all we need to do and that's it for the application markers relatively simple and straightforward let's go ahead and get into the mind map map and i'm going to start out with the first one called load staff that is the macro that we're going to focus on that is this macro that's going to basically allow us to refresh everything clear everything out and get and determine all the staff that are associated based on the filters that are set up here. Remember, if I select another staff, it's only going to show these staff. If well, if I refresh, it's going to go back to all staff. But if I select here, it's going to only be a given staff here. So this macro is the one that is tied to this button here. If we take a look inside this button, clicking assign macro, we see it's called mind map load staff. That is the first macro that we're going to go over in our mind map module here, load staff. Okay. The first thing what I want to do is reset all those filters in H3, J3, and L3. Those are our filters located right here. H3, J3, and L3. I want to set it to all staff, all projects and all statuses right because we want to clear everything out make sure there's no associated filters we'll keep the dates the same right that's fine so that's going to let us load that so we're going to do that first that's going to reset all of our filters there at least for our staff projects and statuses i also want to remove all the mind map shapes now we're going to be going into a little bit naming uh, in a little bit but basically what i want to do is if i've got uh, tasks displayed projects displayed i want to remove everything right so we've given them very specific names right so that way when i click refresh i can remove all the names associated and even the staff names are going to be removed and replaced so to do that we're going to do this so we're going to remove all mind map shapes so we're going to loop through all of the shapes inside the given sheet now we're going to use mm shape as our variable here mm shape has already been defined here as a shape so we know it's a shape so for each shape inside dot shapes i want to check for something i want to look at based on the name obviously i don't want to delete every shape on the sheet i don't want to delete this these shapes or this refresh or this icon or this uh, text up at the top 
only these shapes, or especially any of my sample shapes or icons, only the shapes associated with the mind map. So each mind map shape has very specific naming involved that no other shapes have. So what we're going to look for is MM staff. These are all the shapes associated with our staff. So if I right click here, we see this is called MM staff one, this is called MM staff two, and so on and so forth. So I want to remove every shape associated with this. If we take a look at this, this is called MM staff picture one. So both of these shapes start with MM staff, right? and also this one is MM staff expander staff two. So all these shapes, even this little one here, this connector, MM staff connector. So all of these shapes start with mm staff so that way we can remove all of them very easily using this so mm if the name contains contains mm staff is greater than zero meaning the shape does contain the name then we're going to delete it delete all the staff shapes now for our projects something very similar if i select on here and we take a look at the projects here this one's called mm proj p r o j this is called MM Proj icon and then MM Proj uh, expander. So you get the idea. They all start with that and then they end a little bit. But all of our project shapes start with MM Proj. So I want to be able to remove those also. So that means any shape that starts with MM Proj is going to also be deleted. The same thing with the task group, right? If I got a group of tasks here and notice it's called task group, right? So this group of tasks I want to remove are connectors here are called mm project so those are going to be associated with the project auto remove and then i want to remove in this group so any groups that start with task group i also want to remove so anything that starts with task group we're going to remove that'll remove all our task groups and then also any icons yes i do even want to remove these icons because each time when we run this particular macro those icons are going to be brought directly from the admin screen that means if there's any changes to the icons the new ones are going to also be brought here so these here are called icon one icon two icon three and icon four so i also want those removed as well so any shape that contains the word icon is going to be removed so we're going to loop through all those and delete everything so that's going to great so if i were to stop that code right here and then i would go ahead and refresh that we see that when we take a look now everything's been removed even our icons are removed everything's been cleared out okay so if we continue with this code here we'll see that everything automatically updates and our get our staff is now updated let's continue on with the macro now that we know that all the shapes have grown so what i want to do is first again as i mentioned to you i want to notice if there's any changes in those icons we already saw when i tested it that i made a change to these icons and those changes were automatically reflected in the mind map to do that, I want to make sure that we're going to loop through all the icons. And if an icon does exist, I want to place that icon directly inside the mind map sheet. And the reason is I want to that I don't individually pull them from the admin sheet each and every time. It's, it's a lot faster if they're already on the current sheet. So I want to make sure that they're on the current sheet already. To do that, we're going to run a loop. And I want to run the loop where there's up to five different icons. As you've seen here, we have places for five different icons. If we want to add an individual icon, we could. So I want to loop all the way from 8 to 12 or up to five different icons. To do that, we're going to run an icon number. Those are the numbers that we're going to be assigning to the icon. I'm going to check that E and the icon number plus 7, meaning starting on row 8, starting with 1, if it does not equal empty, we know that E contains a name, right? That icon type is a name. So I want to make sure if this is not empty, then go ahead and insert it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that icon number and we're going to copy it, right? We should probably add on error zero next. If there's if the icon disappears, it could create an error, so probably should do that. Um, admin shapes icon and the icon number. We're going to copy that icon, whatever that icon is. Then what we're going to do is we're going to activate the mind map sheet with the mind map shape. We're going activate that then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select on a cell this keeps from I want wherever I want to place it I want to place it the first one in in a 21 plus the icon number so the first one is going to show up in a 22 I'm going to select that cell once I select that cell remember if we cannot select that cell without first activating it because we're for not on the sheet and we're running this macro it's going to create an error anytime you use select you must make sure that we've activated the sheet just to be sure in case that we're trying to run this macro from another sheet it would create an error we can't select a cell on a sheet that we're not that's not currently active we're going to then paste in that macro okay if there's any error we're going to let it know so we could probably do on error let's do on error go next here too just in case there's an issue with the error 
with the uh, particular icon or the icon doesn't exist they would create an error so we're going to have that there great so we're going to paste that in there all right so we're going to sip this is simply going to copy all the icons from the admin screen and bring them into our mind map sheet i also now what we're ready is we're ready to place all of our staff here and so what I want to do inside here is I want to get our original top position, our left position, somewhere around F5, but not exactly, right? A little bit off that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set our initial left position on F5, but not exactly. I want to move it over to the right a little bit. I'm going to increment that 30 pixels to the right. So we're going to do that. That's going to set our initial left position. Set initial left position. I also want to set the initial top position. Now that top position is going to be based on our also on f5 but on the exact top position so this will be set initial top position so once we have that we can then continue on i also want to get that picture folder if we're going to be extracting those pictures directly from our picture folder i need to know the full file path of that that full file path is also located in the admin so what we can do is we're going to set that picture folder based on the admin and the picture folder if we take a look inside back inside our admin we take a look inside this we see that d3 has also been assigned a named range called picture folder picture folder also just to make sure that the named range here picture folder should be different than your name bridge here uh, right here called pick folder notice that these are different try not to keep them the same I have had issues before where the named range and the variable name if they're the same it could create some issues so we want to make sure the pick folder is different than picture folder I also want to put a backslash onto the end of that because we're going to be adding the picture name that picture name is going to become directly from our staff list right here here it's going to be pulling them but i want to pull that from here so notice each staff has a name as we added that one in so continuing on to our, with our macro so we're going to set our initial folder along with the backslash we're going to run the staff filter what i want to do is i want to base it on this filter here if there's any staff that have been based on a filter here i want to run an advanced filter based on all the data all the way through row 46 here and i want to run the criteria based on any criteria all the way from O2 through S3 and I want to have unique staff that unique staff is going to be here right I want all the unique staff associated with it to come down here then what I want to do is I want to have the picture associated with that staff appear here now notice that that picture is not in our original data that picture is located in our staff list here so what we need to do is we need to extract that picture and we can do that with a named range to help us out so we have two named ranges that are going to help us out we have staff name which is a dynamic named range and I also have another one called staff picture here and so right here is a dynamic named range for staff picture so we can see the staff picture right here so all we need to do is simply use the index and determine on the staff ID so we're going to close this out and so what I want to do inside our tasks is create a formula so as we load in I want to create a formula right here and I want to bring down this formula so it's going to bring down those pictures so what is this formula first of all we're going to check to make sure that if error we're going to index the staff picture right that's what we want to locate that staff picture and we're going to base it on the staff id in u3 and I'm going to base it on and then what I want to do is I want to show that single column because it is that sta staff picture that I want to extract if there's an error just show blank so as we bring this formula down here using VBA it'll extract all those pictures then I have the staff id the staff name and the picture all present all ready for us okay so that's what we're going to do and i'll do that inside the macro so the first thing we want to do is i want to clear the contents of any i want to delete all the contents here right just clearing that out all the way from u to w to make sure that we don't have any old data so range u3 through w999 clearing any previous results i want to get the last row of our original data using end xlf then what I want to do is I want to make sure that we actually have data in the last row if it's less than four that means we have no data right if it's less than four right in this case our last row is 46 but if it's less than four that means we have no data we can exit the sub then what we'll do is we're ready to run our advanced filter based on the original data a3 through k in the last row a3 all the way through k actually we're gonna use a blank we probably don't need to use blank I could probably use we could probably use just here all the updates but we'll go through j we'll go through j but either way it's fine if our results keep this in mind if our results here unique staff include a blank here then we do need to include a blank but we can use in this case we'll use j it's sufficient enough we don't need to include that so we also want that criteria that criteria range is going to be o2 through s3 
O2 through actually S4. I'm going to change that O2 through S4 to make it a little more clear. O2 through S4, and that's going to bring, because we need to make sure that we're going to include all the dates associated with O2 all the way through S4. Because we need to encompass all that data, right? We need to include both the due dates and the starts, the status, the project name. So that's our criteria. And I want those results to come U through V, U through V. Now that staff picture will be added on later in the next step. So the results, though, this is the first step of the results. All we're going to be doing is bringing in both the staff ID and the staff. So those results are going to come directly in here, U2 through V2. Once we have those results, I need to check for the last row. That last row using column M is row 8 using column U. So I'm going to check that to determine the last row. That last result row is based on column U. If that last results row is less than three, that means we have no staff for that period of time, and we can exit out of the sub. There's no staff to load. If we do have staff, what I want to do is I want to take whatever that formula that we created to extract that staff picture, this was called the staff picture formula, and we want to place that all in all of the rows associated with that in column W. So W3 through W in the last results row formula equals whatever formula is in W1. And that's going to bring it and automatically calculate it. And the reason we do this is we don't really want formulas floating in an entire column. We don't have any staff, right? I only want formulas where they're needed, right? We don't want a workbook full of formulas that are not being used. So I want to make sure that they're being used. And to do that, we only place them in the cells that we need. So in this case, W3 through W8 formula equals whatever is in W1 formula. That's going to bring in that formula and show those pictures. We need those pictures because it is those pictures that we're going to be able to display directly inside our shapes here because I want those pictures. When I take those picture names and I combine them with that picture folder along with the backslash, we then have a full file path and we can then insert that picture and then position it accordingly. And we're going to do that with the following. So then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all of those results. So we're going to have our results. Here's our results all the way from three to eight. I'm going to loop through those adding shapes based on those individual staff. So for the results row equals three to the last results row, we're going to create these staff shapes. But first I need to extract some information and put that information into variables. So the staff ID is simply going to be whatever's in U and the result row. Right? That's our staff ID coming from column U. We then want to have our staff name. That's going to come from column V. And then I want to have that staff picture. and That's going to come from column W. Putting all those into string variables. Then what I do is I'm ready. Now I've got all the data that I need. Now I'm ready to create those shapes. So what we're going to be doing is taking our sample shape right here called MM sample. I'm going to be duplicating this and then I'm going to be renaming that shape accordingly. So the first thing we want to do, mind map with that shape, MM sample. We're going to duplicate that and then we're going to give it a very specific name calling MM staff. Remember, we need to make sure we give it very specific names so that we can remove it very, very easily when we need to clear it out. So we're going to give it MM staff and we're going to give it making sure that it is a unique name. So we're going to tie the staff ID to that because each staff has their own unique name number and therefore we know that the name of the shape then is going to be unique once we've given it a name we can then focus on working with it so with my map shapes that brand new shape that we've created we can then position it we're going to base it on the left position that first initial left position base it on the top position that's that first position that we've created what i also want to do is i want to place the name inside the text right their name text frame text range text equals the staff name we're going to set the staff name as text okay then what i want to do is i want to auto shape it. if we notice that notice these shapes mary smith has a smaller one david davidson has a larger one right so i want those shapes to be dynamic the widths i want to be dynamic however if we just auto shape them completely and don't set a height they're going to have different heights i want them all to have the same height but i want to have them different widths based on the name right so notice each one has a different width and that is because we are using this one auto size text frame and it's auto shape we want the shape to fit the text right size shape to fit the text so now the shape has been fixed now this is going to be both horizontally and vertically both width and the height are going to be auto size but i don't want that i only want the width so what we're going to do is we're going to set a very specific height we're going to set that height to 18 pixels okay so that way they're all going to have the same height but they'll have different widths and that's exactly what i want it's going to give it a nice look of uh, customized so that we don't have any extra spacing right so it kind of gives it a little bit better look great so now what i mean we've already placed the shape so now it's time that we place that picture 
Now notice this particular shape that we have here. If we take a look at this and we look in the format here, we'll go ahead and format this shape. I'll right click and format. We see that in the text options here in the text options, I've given it a very left margin of 0.3. I've given it space for that picture, right? If I were to reduce that to zero, it would be all the way there. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we have space. And I've given a little bit of a right margin of 0.03. That's going to give us some spacing on the right. So it's not only the right. And we've got plenty of space for that picture, 0.3 3 there. So we see how we've created that sample shape. Once we duplicate that sample shape, all the shapes are going to be accordingly automatically. All right, so we've given it that. So now what I want to do is I want to add the picture. First of all, we need to make sure that the variable that we've created here, staff picture, doesn't equal empty. If it does, we're going to use the icon. If it doesn't, we're going to add the picture. So if staff picture does not equal empty, then staff picture exists. All we need to do is combine that picture folder that we've already defined up, uh, all the way up here. We've defined it directly up here. One of the first things we did was define that picture folder right up here. Okay, so we've defined that already. So now all we need to do is simply add it in here. So how are we going to do that? So what we want to do is I want to get that full picture path right here. That picture path is simply equal to the picture folder along with and the staff picture. Those combined is our full picture path. I want to check to see if it's an accurate path. If it's inaccurate, we're going to use the icon. If the directory of the picture path, VB directory, equals empty, it's not an incorrect path. We're going to go to bad path. And that's going to just going to skip all the way down here and go right to here. But if it is a good path, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be inserting that. So what I'm going to do is mind map shapes staff sample. I'm going to create this. I need to then duplicate this one right here, this shape right here called staff sample. I'm going to duplicate that and give it a very specific name. Duplicating it, giving it a name called MM staff picture and the staff ID again, giving it a very unique name. Then we're going to work with that. So I'm going to set that left position to the same left position. I'm going to set that top position based on the top position of whatever our current shape is, right? Remember, we've did the MM staff. I want to know the top position of the shape that we created here. What is the top position of the shape? Remember this shape that we created here? What is that top position? It's going to be MM top. I want to make sure we give it that same top position. Then I want to fill it, right? I want to put that picture inside that shape. We can do this with fill, user picture, and then the picture path. It's going to be that fills the shape, fills shape with staff picture. So that's all we need to do. And then all we need to do is just set the height. Okay, then what I want to do is I want to set the height to 18 and the width to 18, something very, very specific. What that's going to do is set that square, making sure that each one has a very specific height and a very specific width, 18. Great, so that's it. So then we've added the picture. But what if there's no staff picture, right? This is only if the staff picture does not equal empty. What if it is empty? That's going to be else. Or what if there's a bad path? If there's a bad path or there's no staff picture, then I want to use that icon. Remember that new staff we added had that icon, right? Or remember when we create that that false path, right? We know that as soon as we refresh that page here, we can then see that the icons are used. So in that case, we want to make sure that we're using the icon that's here, and that's going to be icon one. That's the icon that we're going to be using in case the pictures are incorrect. So to do that, all we need to do is just set up that icon going to do that mind map shapes icon. It is that same icon that's located in this sheet called icon one. We know it's there. So icon, then we're going to duplicate that. And what we're going to be doing is we're giving also a specific name called MM staff icon and the staff ID, same name. We're going to do the same, everything else with that. We're going to place it on the left, a little bit over to the right. And also we're going to give it a little bit lower than the top position, giving it a very specific height and a very specific width. That's what we're going to do if it's an icon. So in case there's no picture, we can add an icon, still have a very professional look even without a picture. Great, so that's it. So now what we want to do is we've added in this shape, we've added in this picture here, and we put it in. Now what I want to do is I want to add in this expander, right? And I want to add in this expander, right? I want to add a connector and expander. So we have one here. It's called this one called staff expander sample. It is this sample shape that I want to then duplicate and I want to place it directly in the middle here. Then what I want to do is I want to take this connector here, this staff connector sample. I want to duplicate that and I want to place it and connect both of these points in here. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we're going to add in that staff expander button. This is the one that's that with that plus. Okay. 
So to do that, we are going to do this. The mind map, we have that sample right here called Staff Expander Sample. We're going to duplicate that. And again, we're going to give it a very specific name, also starting with MM Staff, Expander Staff, and the Staff ID. We're going to duplicate that Staff Expander. It's really a project. It's an expander to expand all the projects for that specific staff. And then all we need to do is just place that once we do it. We're going to place, give it that left position. Now, I want that left position to be placed based on the left position of this so it's going to be based on the left position of this plus the width of that plus another a few spaces and then right in the middle so remember it's the the left position of this plus the width of that plus eight pixels eight pixels over to the right right if i were to change this to let's say 18 right and you see that's going to be even farther away right so you can see it's farther away so that's how we can do that so it's relatively simple just to update it and give it a new look okay i also want to give it i don't want to put it directly on the top i want to put it a little bit off the top not not directly on the top right i want to move it down i want to place it directly in the middle so we're going to use the top position of that shape and we're going to place it two and a half pixels down that's going to bring it down a little bit then what i want to do is i want to tie a macro to this remember there's a macro if i click on this there's a macro that's associated with that it's going to expand the projects associated with that staff based on the dates so there's got to be a macro the macro which you're going to be getting into next called mind map load project so i want to assign a macro to that okay great so then we've added in the, we've added in this particular icon now all we need to do is add this connector in this mm staff connector we're going to use this sample here called staff connector sample i'm going to add this in and then i'm going to place it directly in here so to do that we can do the following so mind map shape staff sample we're going to duplicate that connector that sample connector we're going to give that a specific name called mm staff connector and the staff id also another unique name then what we want to do is we want to place that i want to place that in a very specific point now if i zoom in we need to know what points when we add connectors we need to know what points there's several points that we can do based on the shape we're gonna it's, it goes counterclockwise this is one this is two this is three and this is four so when so the beginning connect based on this shape mm staff one is 0.4 again what goes in counterclockwise here okay so when we select on this this is one this is two this is three this is four always in counterclockwise now we also want to place it on this shape here right so i want to place the other end the end connector on this shape so if i drag this over we see one two three so i want to place it on three right counterclockwise so starting at one two three four going four and then going to three so that's just what we're going to do directly in here so our connector format the beginner connected where are we connecting it to we're connecting it to this shape directly or mind map shapes mm staff that's the first and we're connecting it to point four remember telling us one two three and four and the second one we're going to go one two three counterclockwise so the second shape we're going to the end connect connector format and connect is going to be placed on this shape that's expander shape and we're going to put it on position three I mean, if i were to change this it would probably look quite ugly but if i were to change it to here right and i refresh that and we could see it let's go ahead and no, it didn't change that oh let me change it here let's put it to let's say six here i like that better so if we were to refresh it it's going to look kind of kind of ugly but you see the point right well the point is now it's on the sixth spot so let's count again here just so we zoom in and we know all the spots one two three four five six right so you can go all the way around so you just do that and you know that it's position three three is the correct one that we want on there okay so we see how that not 63 three okay so we see how the points along we know how to count them counterclockwise to find the right point you want to connect then all we need to do as we loop is we want to increment 50 right so i'm using 50 if we want our if we have a let's say we have a lot of staff right we don't want them so far apart maybe we only want them to increment maybe 30 so if i were to change this to 30 they're going to be a lot closer together so see how they're closer together right so that's going to be good if you have a lot of staff that might be helpful we'll keep it at 50 for our purposes so all we need to do is just increment that top position as we loop through the staff and then next result row so that just loops through the individual staff that's all we need to do to then create this great so now we've got our but now how do we actually create the projects when I click here, what do I want to do? Well, I want to add in specific staff right here in our filter. When we run that advanced filter, what that's going to do is going to take our criteria and put it in here. And it's going to return 
only those projects in here that are associated with that staff. And then I'm going to loop through those projects. And I'm going to create those three shapes based on the project in those loops. And then I'm going to add a connector and then add that. So that's what we're going to do inside the next macro. And that is the one, the same macro that we saw, mind map load projects. It is this macro that's the tied to that particular shape that we said, that expander shape that we had there right here. This is the macro that we added to that expander, right? On action, remember when we click here, there's a macro that's tied to that button. It's the macro that's gonna create these shapes here. That's the macro that I wanna go over for you now. Mind map load projects. So the first thing what I wanna do is I want a unique project ID as a string, project name as a string, and the project count. I wanna know how many projects are associated with this. It's gonna help us in spacing. The first thing I wanna extract some data. I wanna know the staff ID. What is the name, right? I wanna know what is the staff ID, and I also wanna know the staff name. How do we get the staff ID? If I know, let's take a look, let's shrink this down and take a look at the original. If I right click on here, I see that this is called MM staff. Uh, expander staff one, right? We know the staff ID is one. If I click here, we see the staff two, and then here is staff three. So what I want to do is I want to extract that staff ID. So how am I going to get that staff ID? I'm going to use the application caller. That is the name of the shape that called it, right? And all I need to do is remove this MM staff expander staff. If I take, if I find the name that, that called it and I remove this and I replace it with nothing, what's that going to leave me with? It's going to leave me with just this one or just the two or just the staff ID. So that's all we need to do. So the staff ID using the replace along with the application caller, we're going to remove the, this next, replace it with nothing, and that's going to extract only the staff ID. But I also need the staff name. I want to place that staff name directly in H3. So how do we get the staff name? Well, I, I'll know there's a few ways to do it, but one of the easy ways, we know that this shape, MM staff one, we know the text based on that shape is the staff name, right? If we extract the text, this text right here, I know that's the staff name. So why don't we extract the name? And that's why I love working with shapes because look, this shape, a cell, a single cell can hold one variable, right? Generally one, one data point, but yet a shape can hold two data, right? This shape can hold both the staff ID inside the shape name and it can hold the staff name inside the text so a shape can actually hold two at least two data points right you could probably get more out of it but at least two data points we can hold from a single shape and i really like working with they're not only fast but they can hold more data than a cell so that's one of the reasons so we can do that so the staff name is going to be based on mm staff and the staff id that's that shape we're going to extract it the text frame text range text we're going to get that staff name directly from that and all i need to do is just take that and place it directly inside h3 so once i have that staff name i'm going to place it directly in h3 and what that's going to do is add our criteria it's going to automatically add that name here based on the formula to our criteria right here so we can do that right here h3 is going to equal the staff name i don't want to make sure that we're resetting all the projects right if i click staff name right let's say i click here right I want to set notice that our projects here, let's use a smaller, let's say a project here is called Fred's Remover, right? If I decide I'm going to click this again, I want to make sure that this goes back to all projects, right? If I hide it. So it's going to go back to all projects just to make sure that this is reset. So I want to make sure that it's on all projects. So now what I'm going to do is I want to make sure that if there's any projects, notice that we collect, I only want to show the projects one at a time. So what I want to do is I want to first remove any other projects from any other staff that have been created. So to do that, we can loop through all the shapes. And if we take a look inside that, we see that this is called MM Project 1, MM Project 6. So again, the names are very important, even the icon, MM Project icon. So I know that any shape that's associated with MM Project is going to be removed. So we're going to loop through all the shapes Again, MM shape. This time, we're going to look for any shape with MM project. If it's greater than zero, we're going to remove that shape. I also want to remove anything that's called shrink staff, right? Shrink staff, I want to remove all other shrink staff. What does that mean? That means I want to make sure that if there's any other, this particular is called shrink staff two, if I select this minus one, it's called string staff. I want to hide all those, right? Anything that says string staff, I want to hide it and I want to put my own. Notice that this is this one's called string staff. This one, this one's called expand staff, right? So I want to remove all the string, any other string staff. If I click on this one, this button here, I want to make sure that that gets hidden or removed. So to click that, just undo that so we can do that here so anything that says shrink staff then i'm going to delete that remove all shrink staff or project buttons i also want to remove any task group right if i click here there's a group 
a, a group of these tasks called task group, right? If I click another one here, I want to make sure that I've removed not only all the projects, but all the tasks associated with this particular staff. By doing this, you see how all the tasks got removed. So I also want to remove anything that says task group there. Also, I want to remove, if there's anything, if there's a visible, let's say there's a staff expander, if it's greater than zero, I want to show it, right? This one, if MN staff does not equal zero, I want to make it visible. What is that? The expander staff. I want to show that to make sure that they're all visible. That means this one right here, this one right here, when I, when I click here, that plus is there, but it's hidden, right? That plus is hidden. I want to make sure that it becomes automatically visible, right? So for everyone that's expander, if it contains that, I want to make them visible. So all the expander shapes, including the one we're on, showing that visible, making sure that they're visible. So we're going to loop through all that to make sure. That means we only want it. Now all we need to do is really focus on that specific one. All we did there is simply clean this up, right? That way when we select it, because if I select another staff, I want to make sure all this gets removed, right? So that's how we're going to do that. So we're clearing that out. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to run our project filter. We've cleaned everything up on the screen. Now we're ready to turn. Again, we're going to do exactly the same filter. We're determining the last row. If it's less than four, we're going to exit this up. We're running our criteria, the same criteria, except this time our results are going to come in a different area. AB2 through AC2, that's where our results are going to come. I only focused on the projects here. AB2 through AC. And again, we can make this Let's check our original data, right? Making sure that it is J, not K, right? That's just going to help, but it shouldn't make a difference. It still works just fine. So then what we want to do is I want to determine the last row based on A, B, right? This is our last row because I'm going to have to loop through all the projects and I'm going to have to create shapes based on those projects. So I need to know the last row based on column A, B. So if it's less than three, that means we have no projects exist for this selected staff. We've created a staff, but there's no projects. Let the user know that there's no projects for that. So I want to count the projects. I want to know that in this case, right, last row is five. I know that there's three projects. All I need to do is subtract two and to determine the number of projects. So our project count is the last results row minus two. And that's going to get us the number of projects and put it into this particular variable. All right, the first thing what I want to do is I want to know the top position. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? If I want to expand the project, I want to put the, I don't want to put it all the way up to the top, right? I want to put it based, basically, I want to center the projects. If there's two projects, I want those projects centered between that, right? And I want to put it centered, right? It's almost centered there. But I want to put those basically or near centered, just like this, so that as we add them. So I need to determine, first of all, I want to, I want to determine the top position of here. Then I want to determine the total number of projects, right? Then what I want to do is I want to split it in two so that the same number of projects are on top and the same number of projects are on the bottom, right? So that it's split into that. So first of all, the top position is going to be based on the application caller. What is the top position of this? This is the shape that caller. So I want to know the top position of this shape right here. So if I know the top position, in fact, we could probably make it a little bit less, right? So it should be a little bit, a little bit on the top, right? If there's one single project, should be right about there, right? So we'll make it a little bit higher because we're basing it on the top position there. And then what I want to do, to make it probably two minus two on that, probably minus two, just to make it, let's try it with one probably. It's almost perfect, but let's take a look at it. Yeah, that looks pretty good. A little bit less there. So maybe minus four or something. So what I want to do is I want to place it perfectly centered there. And I want to split that. So the top position here, what I want to do is I want to, let's let's say we have about 50 pixels in between each of the projects, right? So let's say we have about 50. That looks pretty good. 50 pixels between the top. So I want to determine if I know that they, we have let's say three projects, what I want to do is I want to multiply that by the project counts, basically one less. I want to multiply it. I know there's 50 pixels here between here, 50 pixels. So I want to take the total number of projects, three, I'm going to subtract one because I want 50 above and I want 50 below here, basically. So three minus one is two, two times 50 is 100. So I've got 100 pixels total. So that's what we're going to do here. So if, let's say our project count is three minus one is two. So we're going to get two times 50, right? That's going to give us 100. I'm going to divide that by two. So it's going to give us 50 pixels above and 50 pixels below. So I'm going to take that top position and I'm going to subtract 50, right? So I'm going to subtract 50. That's going to move it up, subtracting it moves it up 50 and then minus two. That's going to make it almost perfectly centered right there. Almost, ah, let's go to five. I think it's going to be almost perfect. I'm kind of picky about these things. So 
it gives you an idea. So we can see that as we reduce it, right? So now we have it perfectly at center. That looks much better. So it's perfectly centered, right? We've got 50 above, 50 below. If we're adding more projects, right? So take a look at this one. However, take a look at this one. What if the top position is higher? What if it's, I can't be up here. So I need to set the limit to the top position. The top position, this is for projects, right? But notice this one's not centered. Why is that? Because we need to set a limit because if that top position is higher than uh, row five, then we need to set that limit. And that's what we're gonna do in the next line. If, oh, well, for, actually the next line, we're gonna set the left position. The left position is simply, we're gonna move it over. Whatever this left position of this, we're gonna move it over 50 and that's gonna get us our left position. If I were to increase that, right, increase that, I would move it over to the right. If I were to decrease that, it'd be closer. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna double check that top position. I need to make sure in this case that if there's, we can't split this one, right? This, let's say this is 100 above and 100 above, but it'd be too high up. So what I need to do is I need to check that top position. If that top position is less than the top position of this, then set the top position, that minimum top position of the row five. So we're gonna do that right here. If the top position is less than the top position of row five, then we're simply gonna set the minimum top position equal to row five. This sets the minimum top position. And this is a perfect example because you see this cannot be split up there. And the same thing with this one here. Notice it can't, can't be split up at the top position, so we're gonna bring it lower. So this sets the minimum top position. Great, so we set the top position, we set the left position, we know where to place these. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna place this, notice that this expander got replaced, right? Now it's called a shrink button. So I'm gonna take this one, this sample one, it's called staff shrink sample. And I'm gonna replace that plus with the minus shape, right? So we're gonna simply do that. So to do that, all we need to do is duplicate this staff shrink sample. I'm gonna duplicate that, and I'm gonna give it a very unique name called MM staff shrink staff and the staff ID. And that's just gonna give it a unique name. And what I wanna do is I wanna hide this. I'm not deleting this, this plus here, right? This plus here, I'm just gonna hide it. I'm gonna simply make it hidden, and then I can show it visible. We don't need to delete it and recreate it. We can simply just hide it and then show it up, right? So when I click here, it's really gonna, again, make that visible. So. To do that, we can simply do this mind map shapes staff visible, this expander button visible equals false. So we're gonna hide the expander shape. Next up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that staff, I wanna place that, that we just created this shrink staff and we're going to place, let's call this place, a shrink, shrink button, right? That shrink button in place. Okay, put it in place. So we're gonna place that left position directly based on the existing staff, right? I wanna place it, this is the one we've just hidden, the staff expander, but I wanna place it exactly where it's where the same one's located, exactly where the left position of the expander button is and exactly in the top position. And since they're already sized exactly the same, we don't need to size it. And then I wanna give it a very specific macro. And this macro is gonna be called hide product. Projects. We're gonna go over that next. So this macro is very different because in this macro, we're simply going to hide the projects or delete the project actuality and then display that macro button. So it works very, very well. Okay, so continuing on with the code. Now we've placed that expander with staff shrinker. We've replaced it, right? And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through the results. We've got our results right here inside our projects. I'm gonna loop all the way from three to our last row. And we're gonna be creating very, very specific shapes based on those projects along with icons and along with their own expander buttons so that we can expand the tasks accordingly for that specific project. And to do that, we can loop through this. So for the result row equals three to the last result row. I need to get the variables and I'm all I'm gonna be doing is getting the project ID from AB and getting the project name from AC. So we can do that here, project ID through AB, AB and the project name through AC. And now what we're gonna do is, again, I'm gonna take that same shape that we're gonna be using throughout that MM sample and we're gonna be duplicating that to create our project shape. So we're duplicating that just as we did here, right here, duplicating it and giving it a very specific name based on the project. This time we're basing it on MM project and the project ID being unique because that project has a unique ID. Then we're gonna focus generally on that. All I need to do is place it on the, using the top position and using the left position, which we've already defined up here, right? We've already defined 
all the way up here the mm top and then the mm left position so we've the mind map top are already placed and the top position is simply going to be i want to make sure that the top position is going to be based on this that's the icon here the top position is here okay so now what i want to do is i want to add that this particular we've created not this one here not this one. Let's keep keep track here we're moving on okay so this one i also have duplicated this shape but i need to give it text that text inside there is simply going to be the project name so to do that text frame text range is going to be that project name so this is going to set the project name and again just like we did with the staff i want to automatically size it as far as the width is concerned because that way we have different widths for our different projects based on the text so to do that all we need to do is use auto size and then use shape text to fit and then of course making sure that we do set the height so that they all have the same heights of 18 pixels now we can add that project icon and i know the project icon that's going to be icon 2 and it's located right here this is our project icon we've already brought it over so that's what we're going to be using right here all i need to do is take icon 2 and duplicate it accordingly and place it directly inside here so with mind map in case there's no icon we can uh, loop through that get rid of on air resume next and the mind map shapes icon 2 is what we're going to be focusing on we're going to duplicate that giving it also a specific name mm project icon and the project id so now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focused working directly with that all i need to do is place it on the left position plus one right i don't want it directly on the left of the left position just moving it over slightly to the right so we're going to add one to that left position and also what i want to do is i want to set the top position based on the project whatever project id this whatever this here called mm project six i want to place it at the top position on this plus one down whatever the top position of this current shape is plus one so it's not right on the top so placing it on the left in the top position giving it a very specific height and a very specific width that's all we need to do that so that's going to place our both our project and our project icon now what we want to do is i want to add a staff connector i want to add a very specific connector or here or actually our staff connector here so i'm going to add a connector here and it's going to be based directly on this it's going to connect from the mm staff shrink staff and it's going to go all the way to our staff so we're going to use this connector right here if we zoom into this i've created a connector a little bit of a fade color from blue to green and if we want to know how to do that all we need to do is right click format the shape and we see that it's a gradient line from blue to green so given a basic blue to green so we give it a name called project connector sample project connector it is that one that i'm going to duplicate it and i want to connect it to this shape here mm staff shrink one and i want to connect it right to here so to do that all we need to do is do project sample we're going to duplicate that giving a very specific name project connector and the project d is going to duplicate our staff connector let's connect our staff to our projects and then again just like we did before we need to sign it very locations right we know the two shapes that we're going to that are going to connect it together it is going to be this one mm staff shrink staff together with this one mm project right but now we want to know the positions again if we count the positions one two three four five six seven we want to connect to the seven spot and on this one i want to connect it to one two so it's going to start out at point seven on that and it's going to go to point two so we can do that right here so with this particular brand new shape that we just created we're going to connect it to our staff shrink and the staff id this is why it's important to extract that staff id we need that staff id remember that was one of the first things we got up here right up here we extracted that staff id that's very important because i need to know what connector to tap that staff id is right here i know the rest of it but i need to combine it to the staff id if, so i know exactly what shape to connect it to right if i expand this one i need to know that it is staff two so getting that staff id is very important so i know the rest is the same so i know exactly where to put those connectors in so we're going to find that staff connector right here so we're going to put that staff connector scroll down to find where we were so here so we're going to connect it to the mm staff shrink staff and the staff id 0.7 on that and we're connecting it to the one we just created mm project and clicking in 0.2 right from seven all the way around here 2.2 so that's going to connect it right there that's it so now what we want to do is we want to add the project expanders right so we've added in the staff connectors now what i want to do is i want to add in the project expanders, right if i'm going to expand this project right here i need to add in this so 
this called MM Project Expander Project 2, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, first thing we're going to use is this sample right here. I've created this sample called Project Expander Sample. It's the same thing, just in a different color, right? I could have changed the colors with VBA. So I'm going to place that directly here. I want to place it so that I can expand that project and then show all the tasks accordingly. So I need to place that and then also need to duplicate that. So adding in those expanders, we're going to take that Project Expander, that sample expander. We're going to duplicate it. We're giving it a unique name based on this and the project ID. Then what we're going to do is we're going to focus, we're going to place that directly on the left, right? I want to place it on the left position of this, plus the width of this, plus a little bit more, and I want to place it directly in the middle, just like we did before. So we're placing it based on the left position of that original shape for the project, plus the width of that shape, plus a little bit more, plus eight pixels. And I also want to place the top position based on the top position of that project ID, plus a little bit down 2.5. That's going to drop it down, center it. Then, of course, I want to assign a macro to that. There's a macro that we're going to focus on. That macro is going to load these tasks up. So I want to make sure that there's a macro that's already been assigned to that. And we're going to call that mind map load tasks. That is the macro that's going to load those tasks up. Great. So now all we need to do is just add this little connector here. Again, this is very easy. We've got another connector here. I'm going to add this blue one here. This one, what does that look like? That, again, that's a blue to green. So I'm going to use that same connector connector here and I'm going to add it directly in here so when we expand it it's going to show and then hiding it let's go ahead and hide that expander so that's the connector I want to add in right now so we're going to do that to do that we're going to use that project connector sample we're going to focus on give it a very also a unique name called project staff connector project staff connector and then what we're going to do is we're going to focus on that again I want to connect it this time we're going to connect it to point one two three point four all the way to again one, two, three to point three. So point four to point three. We're connecting it to the project and the project that you're connecting it to this shape here. And then we're going to connect it to this brand new expander that we just added on point three. That's all we need to do. So as we loop through each project, we're going to do that. And then we're simply going to increment the project so that we have a space, a 50 pixel space between all the projects accordingly. So that's it. That's all we need to do to create those projects. Next up, again, we need to hide the project. Remember, we also created this expander and we also assigned a macro to this called collapse task collapse to actually this one right here sorry this one right here that will we haven't got into that one yet this one here right when we expanded those projects we had a macro here that's been associated with this one this one is called actually uh the high projects that's the one i want to go in and what's this going to do well the when we click on that it's simply going to hide all those projects or actually delete them so that's the macro that i want to go into now so the first thing what i want to do is i want to reset all the project if i've clicked a project here i want to make sure that we're resetting all those projects i want j3 to go to all projects right because i'm clicking on another staff i want to make sure that it goes to all projects here so setting j3 to all projects next up i want to loop through all the shapes i want to remove any shapes that are associated with projects and any shapes that are associated with tasks. As we move through different staff, I want to make sure that all of this got removed when we click on that one. So when I click on this here, I want to, so let's say I click on here and I've expanded different here. I want to make sure that all, when I click on hiding that, I want to make sure that all those get hidden. So we need to simply loop through those and look for any shapes that are based on project or based on tax and simply delete them. So we can do that here. So we're going to look for any shapes as we loop through all the shapes in the sheet. Look for any shapes that are associated with those tasks, such as the group, right? Group, task group six here, task group project uh, two, and re remove all those associated with that. And also what I want to use any expanders, right? Move any shrink or may remove all shrink or staff project buttons here. And also the staff expander, make sure that that is now visible. Remember, we've hidden that expander, right? We've hidden it. When we move here, we hide it. Now we need to show that this staff expander and we need to know that staff ID, also important there. So we're going to do that expander staff. Any shape that contains this, we're going to then, if it's greater than zero, we're going to make sure that that's visible, showing that, okay? So that's going to loop to show that expander. I want to make sure that all these expanders are displayed and none of the shrink ones. So that's going to show them. All right, so that's all we have to do to simply then hide, oops, 
simply hide any uh, tasks that are associated or projects that are associated with the task as we remove that and expand it. Great, so the next macro that we're gonna focus on is the load tasks. Now this is the macro, when I click on a specific here, it is the macro that's loaded here. That is the macro that's tied to this button. If I right click here and we assign the macro, we see it's called load tasks. Remember, this is the same macro, load task, that when we added that here, load task, it is the same macro when we created that expander. It's the same macro that we created on the action when we created that expander. And that's the one we're going to go over now, load task. So what that's going to do is load all the tasks. Now, it's a little bit tricky, that top position, because I want to make sure that we always have position properly, right? If I add this, I can set a reasonable top position for this. But if I add another one, I need to bring that top position down. Very hard to work with these unless we actually group these. So we're going to make sure that we're grouping all the tasks associated with the project and giving it a very specific name on that. And that's going to help us out. All right, so let's get into the macro that's going to work with that and help us do that. Okay, it's called load tasks. And we certainly need some unique variables, task ID, task name, status, color, right? We're coloring the icon and of course shrink shape as a string. I want the project ID, name, group, and array as a string. We're going to be looping through those. I want the task count. I want to know how many tasks, the row and last project row. The group count, right? How many groups we have. We need to position those. So I need to know how many groups of tasks. The project row as we loop through the projects. And the total task height. I need to determine the height. I want to make sure that the heights of these are separated so that they are not all over each other and that they're separated accordingly. So we need to know that height. Put that into variable. I also want the task group as a shape. And so we're going to be going through that. All right, so the first thing what I want to do is I want to set the project ID based on the running macro, right? So the, basically what I want to do is when I save a task, I want to make an update. So when I, that's going to, right? So if I, let's say I decide on this, I select phone meeting, right? And let's say I decide that it's going to be an email instead, right? When I make a change to that, I want to update that when I click save. So I need to determine, notice it changed to email, right? And so, and let's, if I click here, maybe you missed that, right? So if I change it back to phone meeting, keep an eye on that. And I want to update that. I want to click save and I want to update that to automatically, right? So I need to know the macro that called it. There's there's one that, that refreshes this based on this save, and there's another one that refreshes it based on this. So there's two different ways that we can run this. So I need to determine, and we're going to use application caller, meaning what is the name of that shape? Project one. I need to know the project. All I need to know is the project ID so that I can determine all the tasks within that project ID. So that project ID is either going to come from here, this number one here, right? This is project here project six right here or it's going to come here so if the pro so if this project if the save button was clicked i know that it's going to be based on project id one so as we load different projects the project id so if i click on here we see that this is project id six if i click on here we see that this is project id two we'll be getting into that in a little bit later on so the project id is very very important because i need to know what tasks to refresh. So the project ID is either going to come from here, this button, or it's going to come from here. And that's going to be based on whatever button I choose. If the button name that I select is called save button, notice this is save button. So that's the icon name here. If I oops, let's click here, if I click save button, that is the icon name. Also, the shape here is also the same name. So that means if the user clicks save, I want to I'll refresh this set of tasks here. And that's going to be based on project ID 2 or whatever project we've selected. All right, so I need to basically differentiate. I need to know is the project ID here or is it here, right? Which one are we doing? Because there's two ways that we can refresh. There's basically two ways that I can refresh the task. I can refresh it here or I can refresh it with the save button. So that's just basically it. So two ways. So I need to determine which one is used, right? So if the application caller is save button, we're going to extract that project ID from B2. However, if the application caller contains this, right, meaning this button right here, let's take a look at these buttons right here. If the, if it's called, take a look at this name button, it's called MM Project Expand Project 6, right? So if the 
apple collar contains this text we know as the button then how do i get that project id then the project id is basically all of this subtracting removing all this text and leaving just the six there that's going to be our, our project id i just need to extract i need to get that project id it's very very important if i have that project id then i know what tasks to put in there so just because i only want the tasks for that individual project so otherwise else right let's put, just put the notes save button clicked and then we'll call this the project expander button clicked or the project expander button project expander button so then we can get the project id here so how do we do that we're going to use the application call the name of the button that clicked it we're going to remove using the place we're removing the text part of the button that's going to replacing it with nothing and that's going to leave us exactly with the project id so two different ways to get the project id based on what button the user has clicked that way we can refresh those tasks regardless if it's on save or if it's on expanded okay so that's very very good helpful okay so now what i want to do is i want to delete this project group if it exists right if this project group exists i want to delete it right i want to remove that so in case i click it so how do we do that well if the project group if it already exists delete the project group it exists only that project group not all of them right not every single project group only the one that exists right only clearing that out only that specific one and that project group is going to be based here task group project and the project one so i only focus on this if it's visible delete it because i want to make sure it's recreated so based on this project id now what i want to do is of course i need and when i expand this i need to basically take this this expander i want to hide it and i want to create a brand new shrink one i want to create a brand new one right on here right so project shrink sample i want to duplicate this and i want to place it directly in here so i want to have that expanded so to do that the shrink shape what i'm going to be doing is getting a name for that i'm gonna set the shrink shape name to project group and the project id that shrink shape setting that name okay now what i want to do is i want to get the project name i want to know the project name so the project name is going to be based on this right i want to know right remember if i if i add this click here not only do i need the project id i need the name why is that name important because that name is important because i need to place it in the filters right if i know the project id remember we've extracted the project id from here or we've gotten it from here if i know the project id i automatically know the name because why because our project name is stored in either one of these shapes so to extract that all i need to do is take this the text take the shape mm project plus the project id and determine whatever the text is inside this shape that becomes our project name i place that project name in j and then i can then filter out using our tasks and determine only those tasks that are associated with the individual project and place them right here so that way the project name goes here the results are only those tasks associated with that project and placing it directly inside here so we need to get that name so how are we going to get that name all i need to do is determine the shape name mm project adding the project id placing the text inside here so here's how we do it so project name is going to be the shapes mm project and the project id remember we're going to take the text frame and the text from that shape and to put it inside this variable then all i need to do inside j3 right here is place that project name put it in that filter and that's going to filter out only tasks associated with that once we run our advanced filter great so now we're ready to now we've all we've done is we've added in this project name here we've already got the staff in here now we're ready to run our advanced filters here and extracting just unique tasks based on the same criteria that we can use basing on the same original data so last year just like we did before with lesson row changing this to j as we had before and then what we did is i want the same criteria right same exact one o through s no actually it should go to four right i'm gonna change this one up here i think i forgot to change this one up here to four making sure that we have that all the way yeah that's what i thought four so not 43 okay so four so that we can get all that i want to make sure that that's accurate because we need to include both dates on that one. okay so moving down finding my place if i'm lucky enough to find it creating those tasks right here copy and this time our results for the tasks are going to go directly inside al i want those results to come al through an2 and that's what we're going to have so i want both the task id the task name and i also want the status because i need to color accordingly that status is important because i need to color that icon accordingly right here so to do that we could we need to color these icons and fill those icons with that color so 
To do that, we're going to have those results come there. Again, pulling the last row based on AL. And then if there's no results, right, if the last results were less than three, then let, let the user know that no tasks exist for the selected project. And we can exit out of the sub. I'm going to turn off application screen update. It's going to make it a little bit faster because we have to move those things. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to sort these, right? In this case, take a look at this. I like the sort. I like the idea of having the sort based on the same here to do in progress overdue and completed i want them in that order that specific order so to do that right i want notice that they're all in that order i want to create a custom order and to do that we're going to use custom order so so that's the order i want so a n3 we're going to set a sort we want to clear the sort fields and we're going to add a key based on a n3 that's going to be the status right if we take a look at our results our status is going to come in a n3 and that's where i want to sort and i want to base it on this order to do in progress, overdue, and completed, right? That's the order that I want to play it. And data option is normal, and I want it ascending. Then I'm going to set the results based on AL3 through AN the last results row. That's going to sort them based on the status in that order. And then we're going to apply that sort. Once they're in that order, I want to determine how many tasks, very important, I want to determine how many tasks. I know if the last row is six, and I subtract two, that we have a total of four tasks. So we're going to do that and set that into a variable called task count. And it's going to be the last row minus two is going to be the number of tasks. I want to get that top position, that top position. Right. I want to know what are we going to do again, just like we did before. We're going to take it based on the project and the project ID. I'm going to paste it on this project. Right. If I if I remove this, let's remove it. If I set that top position, I want to be based on very similar to what we have around here, similar to this, right? So I'm going to base it on that, but I want it a little bit higher than that, right? Based on that. So because I want it closer to the top. Otherwise, we're going to set up. So that top position, it's going to be the top position, and we're going to do the task count minus one, and we're going to multiply it by 50. 50 is going to be the spacing between each task. If we want less spacing, we can do that too. So 50, right, times the task count minus one divided by two, setting the top position split rows above the expander. Okay, we're going to set that left position also based on that, basically I wanted 80 pixels based on this. 80 pixels away, setting the, the left position, moving it over to the right. If it's less than 80, move it closer and so on and so forth. So it's going to set the left position, okay? Now what again, I want to make sure that that mind map, right, that that top position has a minimum, maximum top, right? If it's up higher, setting the maximum based on row five, just like we did before. So the if the top position is less than row five, the top position, then set the row position based on the top position of row five. It's going to set the minimum top position just as we did before. And now what I want to do is, again, I want to replace that expander with, I want to replace it with that shrink button. So again, we're going to do just like we did. We're going to take that shrink sample. We're going to duplicate it. And that's this one right here, this one right here, this shrink sample. I'm going to duplicate it and I need to make sure that it is placed directly in here. And it's going to be the same left position and the same height position as our expander, right? But I certainly want to make that expander. I want to hide that expander, right? When I, when I click here, I want to make sure that this is hidden and the shrink is shown. So I'm going to hide that and show the shrink. And so to do that, we're going to make sure that expander shape is going to be visible equals MS false. We want to hide that one. Then all we want to do is take that shrink, the one that we just duplicated right here, and we're going to place it. I want to place it directly in the same location as our expander, the same left position as our expander, the same top position as our expander. And I also want to, of course, assign a macro to that. That macro, this gives and macro is going to actually be able to hide these tasks. So I want to give it a macro that's going to hide these tasks. So to do that, we're going to give it a macro called mind map collapse tasks. That's going to collapse those tasks, right? So we don't see them. Okay, so now we've basically created this. We've added our expander here. We've shown it up. Now what I want to do is I want to create the associated shapes for that task. To do that, what we want to do is I want to loop through, just like we did the projects, just like we did the staff, we're going to loop through all the tasks associated from three to five. So, or, in the, or the last row. We're going to loop through all the tasks, that last results row. Again, I want some variables. The task ID is going to come from AL. The task name is going to come from AM. And the status is going to go into a variable. It's going to come from AN. And the status is 
exceptionally important because it's going to pull our colors, right? I need to look in here and determine what row the status is on and then extract the color of the cell. And that color of the cell is going to come directly from column C when I locate it. Now I've also created a name range called status here. So what I want to do is I want to find that status, determine what row it is, and then get the color out of it. So that's what we're going to do. If it's not found, it could create an error. So we're going to wrap it in on air, resume next, and on air, go to zero. We're going to set that task row. It's going to be based on the admin status named range we're going to look for something fine we're going to find that tax status and i want to extract the row from it okay and of course if it's not found it would create an error so we're going to check if the task row is not zero then we can determine the task color based on the row that's found based on column c and the task row i'm going to get that interior color and i'm going to extract that i'm going to put it into this variable called task color that's going to help us out when we want to color that icon so now we'll get we're ready to do is we're ready to set up we've got all of our data we've got all our variables now what we're going to do is we're going to create these shapes here again taking our original shape mind map sample and we're going to create this shape right here just as we did before so taking that sample duplicating it giving it a unique name called mm task and the task id which we've already extracted here into the variable now what we're going to do is we're going to work with it we're going to set the left position based on the left position the top position based on the top position and we're going to give it a text of the task name right the task name we've already again auto sizing it text to fit setting the height right and also what i want to do is i want to add a space for the tag the width of that is going to be the width plus the, I want to add some for the icon, right? I want to add a little bit more onto the width here. So I want this, take a look at this icon here. I want to add another icon that's going to help us view that task when I click it. So I want to add, so notice that these didn't have any extra space, but this one I want to create some extra space because I have the search icon or the view icon, I should say, that's going to allow us to click that icon and view the individual task. So I need additional 18 additional pixels to create it. So to do that, we're going to take whatever the current width is and we're going to add on 18 pixels and that's going to add the additional space for the view task icon and now what i want to do is i want to group again like you said you see that these are all in a group so what i want to do is i want to create a string and once i have all of the shapes that i want i'm going to put those in a string and i'm going to create a group based on that so we need to start a string so we're going to call this our task group string and it's going to be whatever is in already currently in the string plus mm task and the task id and a comma i want to make sure these are all separated by comma so we've just started our group string basically all the shapes all these icons all the view icons all the shapes i want them in a single group to group them i need the names of those shapes all in a single string separated by a comma so we're starting this string out right here and making sure to separate it by a comma Okay, now we're ready to add the icon, right? So that icon on the left, take a look at that. Now, what is this? Of course, we're starting out here with this icon right here called icon three is where we want one. It's gonna come directly from here. Our task is icon three, and we've already brought it over here. So I'm gonna duplicate icon three. I'm gonna place it directly here. And I'm also gonna fill that icon with the color associated with the status. So we can do that here. Icon three, we're gonna duplicate that. We're gonna give it a name called mm task icon and the task ID. Then with mind map shapes, task icon, we could focus directly on that. We can give it a left position, the same left position plus three over. I want to move it slightly over, right? I don't want it, to, I don't want that icon all the way over to the two on the left. I want it basically uh, a little bit over to the right. So we're going to move it uh, three pixels to the right of that setting the left position the top position we're going to be based on the top position of the shape that we just created plus four pixels down it's going to move it a little bit down we can give it a very specific height of 16 a very specific width of 16 then what we're going to say is i want the visible line to be true right i'm just going to put a line around it right let's refresh that putting a line around it and i want to color that line and i also want to color the fill color of that so the line color is going to be the task color set the border color and that way if you want the fill color we could just do the borders if we wanted this would be kind of interesting let's take a look at what that looks like i'm going to comment this out let's say we only wanted to color the borders that might be kind of interesting but it's kind of oops let's fix that don't we need the task color here we need to do the task color at least some color here comment this side we don't want to comment the group that group string is very important all right there we go so now we see we got the borders colored but not the fill color but i like how that fill color it shows up a little bit better so we want to uncomment that out and of course all we need to do is just run that again and we see that the fill color is here 
Okay, so now we've got the fill color, right? We're gonna take that fill color, putting it with the task color. And then also what I wanna do is I wanna again combine, I wanna create a string, but now what we're going to be doing is notice we add the shapes up here for our string. Now we're gonna add these icons, taking whatever's already in the group string, adding these individual icons to our group string and a comma, right? So adding these. Now we got one more icon. Notice we have one more icon, and that's going to be here, our MM task view icon. That is going to be called icon four. Icon four is where we're going to be coming directly from here. View task, that's the icon we set for that. And I want to place that directly here. So that's what we're going to start out. So this one, mind map shapes, icon four, we're going to duplicate that, giving it a very specific name called MM task view icon and the task ID. Again, we're going to place it in the left position based on the same left position as we did, plus the width. So we're going to start out with the left position plus the entire width of that task minus 17. So basically the entire width of this minus 17. That way they all have the same width. They all have the same place located there. Okay, and then also the top position is going to be on the top position my, uh, plus three because I don't want it directly on the top there. And then what we want to do is set a very specific height and very specific width. And of course, I'm going to have a very specific macro. That macro is going to enable us to actually view this task and then make changes accordingly if we like. So giving it the, this particular macro, which we will be going over. And then also lastly to our group string, adding this view icon along to our group string so that we can now group it. And then now what we want to do is we add in a connector. Notice that there's a connector attached to this, right? So this time we're going to connect it with project string project one. We are going to take this connector here, task connector sample here, and we're going to be duplicating it. And again, we're going to be attaching it to these positions just as we did here and it to the position two here. And we're going to be putting it there. So first of all, with this task connector here, task connector sample, we're going to duplicate it. We're giving it a very specific name, project, project ID, and I want the unique project ID on this. That's very, very important because I'm going to need to know how to remove it if I have to remove all of the ones associated with that project, the task connector and the task ID. We need to duplicate that task connector. So then focusing on this, right, we're going to set that beginning connector on our project shrink and our project ID. That's this shape right here. And we're going to locate again. It's going to be located right here. I need to place it on location seven. Just know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is going to be this one right here, placing it on seven. And of course, we're going to do the end connector, that end connector based on the task ID, that task shape, and then position two, right? Position here again. This is position one and this is position two. Okay, so that's how we're going to place that accordingly. So now that we have that, so now we've placed it, we've placed those connectors, and now what we're going to do is we're going to increment the top position, 25, right? So there's 25. Just to keep in mind, remember we saw a top position of 50? That is going to be able to separate our groups. Let's zoom out of here. We got way too much, right? So I need a separator to separate the groups of 50 pixels, and I need the separator to separate the individual tasks, which is going to use 25 pixels, right? If I were to increase this to, let's say, 35, you would see that the tasks are more spread out accordingly, right? So then you see they're more spread out here as we expand those here. They're more spread out, but I think 25 is sufficient enough. So we've got 25. So that's going to have the separation between those individual tasks. So then all we do is just simply loop. Once we've added, we've incremented the top position between those tasks, we just loop through all the tasks. Once we've created all the tasks and we're building out this group string, now that I've got all the tasks, all the icons, all of the view icons, everything inside a string, all separated by comma, of course, I need to then create a group based on that. But the first thing what I want to do is I want to make sure that we remove the last comma, right? So we keep adding commas and commas and commas, but it ends, it now ends with a comma, but I don't want that comma to end. So I need to remove the last character of that string. So the task group string, we're going to take the left position. And what do I want the left position? I want basically the left position. I want all the characters inside that string minus, except for the last one. So we're going to take the entire length of that group string, subtracting one, and we're going to take only the left of that. So basically all this does is it removes the last comma, removes the last character, which is a comma. 
Once I have the correct room, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that and create an array out of it, right? Once I have an array, I can then create a group based on that, but we need it into an array. So task group array, that's already been defined up here, right here called task group array as a string, okay? So once we have that, we can then group it accordingly. But what I need to do is I need to split it according to based on those commas. So we can do that here. So task group array is equal to split. We're gonna split it based on that comma. I'm gonna create an array of based on that string, create a task group array. Once I have an array, I can very easily create a group based on that. So mind map, based on the shapes, range, task group array. We're gonna create a group. We're gonna give it a very specific name called task group project and the project ID because these are all the tasks associated with this project. That's why getting the project ID is so important so that we have the project ID and we can then create that group and give it a very specific name. Great. So once we have done that, we can then space out groups accordingly, right? We've created the groups, but we haven't spaced it out. They could be over on top of each other. I need to make sure that they're all spaced out accordingly. Well, that doesn't look very good, right? So I need to automatically space them out. And what does that mean? That means if I select this task, I have no more room for, for another group. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that this gets moved down accordingly before I created that one. And I need to do it automatically. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing what we're going to be doing is we're going to, again, determine the last project row based on AB, right? I need to know how many projects, right? In this case, there's three projects, right? So if we take a look at AB, this is going to be determined the last row. If the last row is five, I know that we have three projects associated. The first thing we need to do is get a correct project count. So the last project row is going to be based on AB. If that last project row is less than four, then go to end macro, right? There's no projects, right? If it's less than four, that means we only have one project. If I only have one project, if I only have one project, let's see this one here, maybe, oh, this one's got one project, right? If I got one project, doesn't matter. We don't need to space it. Everything is just the way it is, right? But if I have multiple projects, then yes, certainly we are going to have to space them out accordingly. One project won't matter. So we don't need to continue on. If it's one project, we don't continue. We just exit, right, end the macro. We're going to skip all the way down here and go to end macro. We don't need to space anything out because it's just one project. Okay, so what we want to do is I want to determine the top position, right? What does that set the initial top position? It's going to be on N5, right? Just going to set a top position. I want to put that into a variable. Remember, five is the row that, that is our maximum top position. It's going to be based on row five here. So we're going to put that into a variable called mm top. And now what I want to do is I want to loop through all the projects. What I want to do is I want to see of all the projects, which one of them have a group, right? We notice that project two and project seven have groups associated with them. So if we look in our tasks and we look at our project, we see that we're looping through the projects. I'm going to check. Does project two, does it contain a, do we have a, a group set for this project? Does, so I want to know how many of them, right? So if I count two projects that have them, I know that we have two groups that are associated with each of those. And if they're visible, then I want to determine the height. So we're going to loop through all the projects, and I'm going to look for task groups that are associated with that project. In this case, we have two, one, two, with, right, project seven. So we can do that here. I'm going to check and run that. So four project equals three to the last project row. I'm looping through the projects right here, looping through these from three all the way to the last row. Okay, so the project ID I need I know is in column A, B. And now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to check to see if we have a group associated with that. But if not, it could create an error. So we're gonna set the task group is gonna be equal to the my map shapes task group and the project ID. All I need to do is run a check to see if that group exists. If it doesn't, it could create an error. Make sure you wrap it in on air resume next and on air go to zero. Now we're gonna run the check to see if the group exists. If not, task group is nothing, meaning it does exist. Not and nothing cancel each other out. Basically, it's saying if task group is, exists, then do what? Then what I want to do is I want to determine the total height. I need to know the height of this, right? The total height of this and the total height of this. I need to determine the combined height of all of the groups. Very important. What is the combined height? So we're going to set that into a variable, the total task height. 
is equal to whatever the total task height is plus the height of that group. So we're going to take the height of that group, the height of this group, right, from the top to the bottom, and put that into a variable. So I can determine, okay, so I know the height of this group, and I know the height of this group. If I know the total heights, I can then place them accordingly. All right, so moving back into the code here, we'll want to do, so what I want to do is I also want to keep a count of the groups. I want to know how many groups. So the group count is equal to the group count plus one, counting those groups. And I'm going to set the task group as nothing. That's very important because as I loop through that, I want to clear out the task group and I'm going to check it again. So basically with this loop here next, with this loop, we're just getting, we're determining the number of counts. Of course, I could count the groups, right? I know that there's two visible groups, right? So how many visible groups are there? How many groups have been created? And I know the total height of all the groups. Once I get out of that, okay, we don't need this. This was not helpful. We probably don't need that. that. was just a check. I'm going to get rid of that one. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the task group to nothing. We're going to reset those task groups, just clearing it out. If the group count equals one, then go to map, right? If we have just one group, then there's nothing we can do. We don't need to place it. We don't need, you know, just one group. It's not going to interrupt any other groups, so don't worry. Okay, but if now what we're going to do is I'm going to run another loop, another loop through all the projects right here, right? So now we know that there's two projects. I'm going to run another loop, whoops, here, another loop all the way from three to last, doing another one. And this time what we're going to be doing is setting the top position based on that loop. We're going to set that project ID again. It's still going to be to AB, setting another project ID. And then also again, I'm going to check another one. And this one, we're checking another one to see if the group exists. But this time, we're setting the top position based on those groups, okay? So we're checking to see if the group, if the group exists, then we're going to do the task group, the top of that task group, in order, what is the top of that task group? The top is going to be based on that MM top. Then the top position is going to increase, right? I need to increment that top position based on the top of that group, plus the height of that group plus 30, right? So again, let's look at this. So the top of this group is going to be based on the, the MM top plus the height of this group plus 30. Then that sets the depth, right? If I make it 20 or something, it's going to be here, right? So if I make it 40, it's going to be down here, right? So we're adding additional space, right? So we can the separation between those groups. We're going to set the task group as nothing, right? We're resetting the task group. So what this is going to do is loop through all the groups, and it's going to place them accordingly. So if I, if I let's say, if I add one here, right, we set the top position here. But if I add another one, it's going to set the top position here. If I add another one, it's going to keep resetting and keep resetting. So it loops through all the groups every single time we create a group. It's going to automatically check for other groups, resetting the height so that there's always sufficient separation between the group of tasks. And that's all we have to do is just loop through the project row and then application screen updating too. Okay, great. So that's how we display the task. But now remember, there's another macro that we're going to hide the task, right? This macro here here is going to hide the task, right? If we take a look here, right click on here, click the assign macro, we see that we have something called collapse task, my map. That is the same macro that we assigned when we created that. And that is the same macro that we're going to go over right now called mind map collapse task. So the first thing what we want to do is determine the project ID. Very, very important, right? If I, I need to know that project ID because I need to know what group to d delete, right? It's going to be task group project two. But what I need to do is determine that project ID. We can do that. All we need to do is, again, determine the application caller, remove the text, and it's going to leave us with that project ID. If I know the project ID, I can remove all of the particular, notice it's project two, I can remove all the lines associated with that, and I can remove the group associated with that as well. So that's what we're going to do. Extract that project ID, looking at that shape, the application call, the shape that the user clicked, removing this text, and it's going to leave us with the project ID. And now what we're going to do is we're going to remove the group that's associated with that. If it doesn't exist for any reason, it could create an error. So we're going to wrap that in on our resume next. So we're going to take that shape and we're going to delete it. Now what we're going to do is I need to delete all of the lines associated with that. And of course, they have MM Project 2 in them. So MM Project and 2, Task Connector. I want to remove all the connectors. So MM project ID and the task connected. That's why it was so important to put that project ID because I want to make sure that I'm not removing task connectors for project seven. I only want to remove task connectors for project two when I hide it. So that's why it's important to get that project ID. So that's what we're going to do. Tap 
project project ID and task connector. If it's greater than zero, we're going to delete all the connectors associated for that project specifically. And then again, I want to make sure that expander, remember that one that we hid, I want to make sure that this is now visible. We hid it earlier, so it's called MM project expander project and then the project ID. I want to make that visible here. So MM project expander and project ID visible equals true. And then also we can delete the shape MM just simply application call it delete that's going to remove the shrink, shrink shape and that's all okay great so we've gone over that and now there's another macro that we're going to do it's called clicking here right remember we give this a specific name this specific name is called mm view icon 23 23 is associated with the task id if we remember here inside the tasks we were able to extract the task id from here and we were to assign it that specific name right if we go up here and we take a look inside there we see that we have the task id that was associated with this right here here we go so we're duplicating that we created that add task connector and we want to know the task id that's associated in the view task the view task button here view task icon here task id we extracted that and we're going to put that in with the name so we know the name right so that means if i click on here this one right here all I need to do is remove this text and I know that the task is associated here if I put that task ID directly inside this one here b5 when I put it I can load up that so that's exactly what we're gonna do in the macro so scrolling down here in the view task let's take a look at this this one right here view task this is the macro that we're gonna go over this is the macro that's been already been assigned to this button here Again, we're going to take the task ID as a string, a task row, and the task column. I'm going to be looping through. I need to load up all the information from all the way from all the way here to E. We're going to use data mapping. And that basically means I'm going to loop from column all the way to column 10. I'm going to take whatever's in the found row, and I'm going to put it in E8. Now, how are we going to get that row? Well, once I take that task ID and I put it here, I want to determine the task row based on that. And we can do that with a formula here called task row. We have a task name range called task ID, right? It's a formula here in the name manager. If we take a look in the task ID, we showed you that. I believe we showed you that before. It's based on these task IDs. So we have a name range based on that. So I'm going to extract the row from that. Our task ID start on row four. So we're going to add three using the match. It's going to get us a row if I know the row. And then what I want to do is I'm going to loop through all the columns once I know the row. And I'm going to take that task name and I'm going to put it directly in E8. E8 meaning right here inside E8. I'm going to take the staff, right? The staff is located right here, the staff name inside column D. And I'm going to place it directly in E7. So we're going to use this data mapping so that we know exactly what cells to place it inside the mind map right here. Close that out. Inside right here. So that's what we're going to do inside that macro. So the task ID is very important, task row and the task column. First of all, again, we need to extract that task ID. We're going to use that, that view icon button. We're going to ex remove the text, and it's going to leave us with the task ID. You see a lot of patterns. It's the same thing we do with staff, the same thing we do with projects, and the same thing we do. So we have the very familiar way that we're doing things. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that task ID. I'm going to place it directly inside B5. What that's going to do is automatically going to calculate the row, as long as we have a row. If it's blank, that means we have an error so or an incorrect task ID, which we shouldn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that B6 contains a value. If it does, then we can load it in. If B6 equals empty, then please select a correct task to view. We can exit the sub out. If we it is correct, we know the task row. Then all we're going to do is loop through the task columns from 2 to 10. Right? We've already got, we don't need to start at 1 because we already have the task ID. All we need to do is go from 2 all the way to 10, loading that information in the selected row and bringing it directly inside here. So that's what we're going to do here for the task column equals 2 to 10, but not staff ID or project ID, which are generated by VBA. What does that mean? And that means that here inside the staff ID, which is in column 3, or the project ID, which is in column 8, I don't want to load. I don't want to bring these into here or here project id why because these are formulas right i only when i saving when i'm saving this i want to put this project id i want to put it directly inside column uh, H right here. And when I'm saving it, I want to put the staff ID, but when I'm loading it in, when I'm bringing this information in and putting it here, I don't want it because it is formulas that generate. So I don't want to erase these formulas. So that means that we're going to load up all the information from column two 
to column 10 except for column 3 and except for column uh, 8, which is column C and H, right? So we don't want to do those things. So we're going to run that loop here. If the task column does not equal 3 and the task column does not equal 8, then what we're going to do is the range. We're going to get that range directly from row 1. That row is coming from row 1 on our task sheet. And we're going to place that directly inside our tasks, right? It's going to be equal to the range, right? We're going to take it directly from our tasks task row, task column, bringing that directly inside our mind map cells. And we're going to get that range directly from row one, as you've seen. So that's it. That's all we have to do to place our tasks directly in. And so that places it directly inside here. That's great. So we have all the information here. But what if we want to make a change? What if I want to make an update, right? What if I want to change that to in progress on this? And I want to save that. Well, that's going to be with another macro. Or we're going to change it. Maybe it's overdue. And we want to save it, right? And now we see the design meeting has now been color changed. So that's going to be with the save macro. And that's going to come inside our task macro module here. So this is the module that we're going to go over here called task macros. And we're nearly done, okay? So what we have is we have task new, right? This is the same macro if we decide to click here. It's going to clear out all the information. We're going to put a default status in here. And I want to make sure that the selected cell is here. So with that cell, we're going to clear out a bunch of cells. We're going to select to do for E9. It's going to set that initial status. And E6, we're going to select. Okay, so that's relatively simple. But when we load it and we want to make a change, we want to make sure that we're saving it. And I also want to make sure that if it's a new project or a new staff, that those get added as well. If it is a new, how do we know if it's an existing product, project or existing staff or not? Well, if we take a look here inside our project ID, it is going to be based on site here. It's going to be based on the select project name. So we're going to do that. I want to know the project ID. So I know that if it's a new name test, right, here, this is going to be blank and this is going to be blank because we cannot extract a project ID from a project that doesn't exist. We cannot extract a row. So those are going to be blank because we've wrapped them on error. And we have some data validation here. We want to make sure that when we want to be able to add add new ones we want to make sure that show error alert this is not selected notice that is project name sorted right we have some sorted project names here it's going to be based on those project names that are sorted notice we have this list of project names and i'll show you how we get to that but they're sorted here i want to make sure that the error list is right because we want users to be able to add brand new projects so we don't want we want to give them the ability to add items that are not currently in the list okay so make sure that's there okay so we have that. And so what I want to do is I want to know, I want to know if either B2 or B3 is blank, we know it is a brand new project. However, if they've selected something, we know that two and three are done. So we've got that here. So but the first thing what I want to do is I want to make sure on a new, if they try to save it, I want to let them know that we did project, project located, the staff, task name, and also the status are all required. So please make sure to add a project, staff, task name and status before saving this task. How do we know that very easily? Well, we can use this some called, something called required fields, right? Let me just saw this fix that here. And then what we want to do is I want to make sure, so I know that we can use count A, and this tells me that there's only a single field using count A, E6, E7, E8, and E9. Of those four fields, only one has been filled in, and that's why we return one. However, on an existing task, if we click here, we see that this is four because all fields have been filled in. So this is an easy way to check to make sure that all the required fields have been um, added values in. And so this is four. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that that is four. So if B1 is less than four, then let the user know to please make sure to add in project, staff, task name, or status before saving, or and status before saving this task. Exit sub because the required fields have not yet been added in. Okay, great. So now what I want to do is I want to know, is it a new project or is it an existing project? And B3 is going to tell us that. Remember, if it's a new project, right, test, B3 is going to be empty. So if B3 is empty, we want to let, then we want to let the user know this project has not been previously added. Would you like to save it or continue, right? If I click save, it says this project is not previously added. Would you like to save and continue? Okay, no. 
okay so we want to give the user the ability to dynamically and quickly add brand new projects on the fly if they say yes then they can continue down so if they say yes they want to add it how do we do that right so project row is going to be the first available project on the project screen plus one right we have our projects here i want to know that first available row getting that and i also want to determine what our next project id is in this case it would be 11. how do we know that well we can use this in b4 to do that max the project id plus one one so that means if there's an error it's going to return one why would there be an error there'd be an error if there's no data so we're going to set the maximum and that's going to get us our project so on a brand new project that has yet to be entered we're going to take whatever's in b4 and i'm going to place that directly inside b13 and we can do that here and i also want to take that and i want to place it directly inside here our selected pro oh, no sorry no need for that because this is a formula no need for that because as soon as we place it in a it's going to automatically calculate automatically calculate because as soon as we place it in a this here as soon as we place that project name directly in b it will automatically be calculated because we have a named range called project names as soon as we place it directly in here okay because we're checking on project names right so as soon as we add that name here it will that row will be found and it'll be placed that row right here so we're checking the project names right formulas let's get escape out of there formulas name manager project name looking down here that is our named range that's located here so as soon as i add that project name here dynamically that project row will automatically be calculated so we're going to do two things where we're adding the project id and we're adding the project name projects row going to set that project id whatever's in b4 that next project id and the name is going to come directly from e6 going to go into column b okay so now that we've added the important information for that project we can then focus on that now what i want to do is i also want to make sure that they're sorted alphabetically notice that all our nice projects are sorted so let's take a look at this let's see if we add a brand new project let's just say let's say fredder wants a new kitchen fredder's kitchen okay we have no project but i want to save that right and it's going to say do you want to save this project click yes now i want that project to now be available inside our drop down list and I want it to be alphabetically sorted, right? So that's very, very important. So when I click on David Davidson again, I want to make sure that that Fredder's Kitchen has now been added here. And I want to know that the application, that scope, that task has been now assigned to that brand new one, right? So I want to make sure that here, not only do I want it added to here, I want it sorted and I also want to be able to hear sorted there's two different lists why are there two different lists I've got one list here called project and another list with all why is that important because this here this drop down list here contains all projects and now it contains also Fredder's kitchen right so if we go into the formulas and name manager we see two different so we have project name let's bring it up project name sorted based on this list i need to populate this list with just the names of the sorted and i also need one with all right i could use the same row but it's fine having two different columns is fine so what i want to do is i want to take that brand new project that we added and i want to put it in this list here and then i want to sort this list and i'm just going to copy this list over here so that's what we're going to do now so what we're going to do is determine the last row of the projects we're going to clear any contents here. I want to clear all the way from NO, just clearing those contents, making sure that they've all been cleared out to make sure that we're having a brand new list. We can update that to N zero, clear the previous results. We're going to take all the information from N, from whatever's in column B here, and bringing it over to here. So we're bringing that over here. Once we bring it over here, we're going to copy the projects, and then we're going to sort them based on the right, based on ascending. I'm going to start N3 because it's going to be based on that project name right here in N3, and I'm going to base it sort normal and sort ascending, and that range is going to be N3 through N in the last row. Once I apply it, it's going to be sorted by name. I then want to populate this list as well. So all I need to do is just take this list and bring it over and copy it to here, simply with a value to value exchange. 03 through 0 in the last row is simply n3 in the last row that's it that's all we're doing now we're going to do the exactly the same thing for staff right if i decide i want to add a brand new staff i can do that as well right so i have a list of staff here but let's say fred's son wants to join the team right so freddie maybe freddie wants to join and uh, he has not been added yet. Again, we have a brand new staff. How do we know it's a new staff? Because we don't have a staff row associated. This staff has not been previous. Do you want to add it? Yes, we do. And the staff, no tasks exist for the selected project. Okay, that's fine. We don't have any staff. 
because now there's no staff, right? There's none, no project, no staff for that, which is fine. And so now we see that project, Fredders. We send, we have, if we refresh the staff, we see we have a brand new Freddy Fredders, and Freddy Fredders had now been assigned that task. So we have a brand new staff. Of course, we didn't add a picture for that staff, but we also want to add a brand new staff dynamically too, just as we did before. And of course, it's going to be based on B9, right? As we added that brand new staff in here, we see that B9 here is empty because that staff has been added. As soon as we select an existing staff, we know that. So we're going to check B9. B9, we're simply matching the staff ID. And that staff ID is based on the staff name. So we're going to take a look at the staff name, right? I want to extract the staff ID from that. But if that staff doesn't exist, it's going to show an error. Otherwise, it's going to be blank, right? It's going to be blank based on an error. So we're going to use match the staff name. We have a named range called staff name right here. Very similar to what we did. Let's take a look at the staff name. We got all the same. Staff name, I've got a single named range based on staff name. I've also got a sorted list based on staff name here. Sorted based on staff and assorted with all, right? Sorted stat with all. And why is that important? Because we have two ones. I've got a staff name here. I want a sorted list based on all the staff names here. Actually, it's not sorted. We should sort it. But I also want to have that available. It should be sorted, but it's not. Oh, it is, okay, not the last one. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that it, we have a drop-down list names. And I also want to have one that's all staff, right? If I would decide I want to have all staff here, I want a named range that includes all staff here. Okay, this one looks sorted properly. Okay, so very good. All right, continuing on. So I want to make sure that we can do that. So we're going to check for the new staff. If B9 is empty, we know it's a brand new staff. Just like we did with our uh, projects, we want to know, do we want to continue? Right? We, this is a brand new staff. It's not been previously added. Do you want to continue? If it's no, we're going to exit the sub. Again, we're going to get a brand new row. If they do want to add that staff, determine the first available row based on the staff. Again, adding in the staff ID based on B10. B10, we're going to show that next staff. Using the max formula, we can also determine plus one, the next staff ID. So the next staff ID. So I'm going to take this brand new ID and I'm going to assign it to the first one here. And I'm also going to put in a brand new staff name located in AB. The rest can wait. This one, the row is not really important. For this particular training, we don't need that. So I just left it in, but it's not necessary for this training. Continue on. So A was going to take on that staff ID. B is going to take on the staff name in E7. Okay, now we're going to sort the staff, right? I'm going to check on this issue here. Sorting the staff, I want to sort based on, oh, that does look correct, just to make sure that's correct. All right, so make sure, I think what we need to do is we need to update the named range on that. Let's take a look at this staff so this staff this data validation should be the is the wrong one that's all it's easy enough right it's this is based on staff name but i want staff name sorted right so we do have the correct so this is going to be based on so all we need to do is just use f3 making sure that we have the staff staff name not project name staff name sorted that's really the one i want here so now when we say take a look this is the right one now everything's sorted right so we had the so the macros working we just need to do we've got three different named ranges right we've got one that's unsorted based on original list we have one that is sorted based but doesn't include all staff and we have another one that does include all the words all staff okay good so that's working correctly now continuing on what i want to do now that we've added the staff i want to again sort the staff by name using the last row again clearing the contents of the previous just like we did with projects clearing all the contents here it's taking our original data and bringing it over here copy over data from from b3 through b in the last row bringing it over into column q sorting it based on Q, ascending, right? And then Q through last row. Then once we have it, just bringing over the information, copying it directly in through R. So that we have two different columns, one including all staff and one including just the names, just like we did before. So that's gonna dynamically add brand new staff. Okay, now what we need to do, so now we've checked for new projects and added accordingly, checked for new staff and added accordingly. Now what I need to know, I need to know, is this a brand new task or is it an existing task? If it is an existing task, we will know automatically based on B6, right? New tasks, B6 is going to be empty. Existing tasks, B6 is going to have a, have a row associated with that. So continuing on. So if B6 value is empty, we know it is a brand new task. We can set the task row based on the first available row inside the tasks 
uh, list here, and it's going to be first available. We can set that brand new task ID. We know the task ID is going to be based on the max formula, task ID plus one. That's going to set that new task ID. So I'm going to take 45 if it's a new task, and I'm going to place it directly in that first available row located in row seven. And I also want to then run our our loop all the way from 2 to 10 and using our data mapping add in all the other data so we can do that right here so but if it's a new one getting that first task row placing the task id and also taking that task id and also placing it directly inside here taking that task id and placing it directly into b5 that new task id that's going to go directly there great so we have that and what if it's an existing task if it's an existing task all i need to do is ex extract the task row from b6 Okay, and now what we can do is run our loop. Now what we can do is we can run, take all the data from here and from, let's say, taking our staff ID, taking our task ID, taking uh, our project ID, and bring all that information into here, staff ID, everything else, and bring it into here using our data mapping, which is located here, using those cells right here. Okay, great, so we have that, so tasks, cells, task row, the task column, is equal to whatever's inside this particular first row here inside our task. Now we can save or update all the data associated with that. Now, up top, all we need to do again is run the macro to load the tasks, right? Remember, that's the macro that we have. So as soon as I update that, let's choose one with a little bit more data in here. So if I change this, right, and maybe I change this to, let's say, in progress, as soon as I save that data, we're going to run the macro that reloads that, and notice the color changed here. So we're just running it. So rerun the macro to load that. Re, let's run macro to load tasks again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run this little fade out message, which you saw here, this little fade out message. This is the shape that automatically just changes the transparency until it's gone, letting the user know, and that we're done with this right here. Just running a loop, changing the transparency of a specific shape called task save message. That's the shape that you just saw. And then eventually it's going to hide it. Okay, great. So lastly, and then what we're going to do is the task delete, right? If I want to delete a task, if I create a new task, and let's create, uh, let's create a task that we can delete it, signing an existing task, giving it a task name, test task here, so we know. And then we can set the due date, uh, let's say 515, setting a uh, due date actually of 530 here and the description test okay so we're going to create that we're going to save that here and now we see that the projects right the staff is on mark right so let's take a look at mark here and we see that our beth roof job is where it's going to be located here so here's the task that we just created right and now what i want to do is i want to delete this task so i'm going to choose delete are you sure you want to delete this task yes and it's going to automatically refresh everything and it's going to be deleted and we see that mark mason now doesn't have that for anymore great so we see that that works so how are we going to make sure well what we're going to do is we're going to check are you sure you want to delete this task giving them the ability to leave then what i want to do is i want to know has this task been saved right b6 is going to let us know it means if i decide to in a project right and i decide i want to delete this project right away if it's not been saved meaning b6 is empty deleting is just simply or she want to delete this yes and it's just going to clear it out where right? there's not, nothing in the database to delete however if there's a row that's already assigned i will need to delete the existing row inside the database so we need to differentiate between that so task row is going to be equal if b6 equals empty we can skip deleting these lines and go to right here so if the task row, if it has been saved, B6 is going to contain a value, we're going to put that into a variable called task row, and then we're going to delete that task row on our task data. We're going to delete that entire row. Next up, we're going to run, rerun, refresh the macro to load the staff, and enter the task new. Cool. All right, I'd also like to check for overdue. I want to automatically mark tasks as overdue. However, we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that for our Patreon members. If you're not currently on Patreon members, now is the time to get on. Patreon's an incredible platform, right, where I do tons of add tons of stuff. In fact, if you want to see something on this that I haven't added, you want me to explain something more clear, or there's something that's not quite working, let me know. Join our Patreon platform. Every single week, I create a brand new feature, fix or focus video, brand new training, a brand new download for our Patreon members. It starts at just a few dollars a month and it's a great way to support this channel well that is it for this week that is the mind map task manager showing
showing you how to take tasks project staff in a whole new level and create this really incredible mind map manager showing you everything how to create those brand new staff how to add those projects how to organize your tasks accordingly and show them so they don't overlap how to view and update and how to create this really cool filter Thank you so much for joining me on this extended training. I really appreciate your continued support. Don't forget to click that like button, comment below, and thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.